Hello and welcome to the Half Wheel Offices. My name is Charlie Mallory. That's Patrick Legree. That's Brooks Whittington. And we're three fourths of the Half Wheel Top 25 voting panel. Brian Burt is somewhere, but he's definitely not here. And we are here today to do the Top 25 Cigars for HalfWheel.com for 2018. And we're here once again to do it live. And we're back in the studio. And if you've learned anything about Facebook Live, uh, half wheel and in the studio it usually means that there's some technical errors but hopefully none so far well, and i'm told it works so great <laughs> uh already off to a much better start than yesterday uh and that also usually means that we're gonna have some beer so brooks what are we drinking today well today we just we had a stout yesterday so today we are going to go with a sour uh side project produces a series of beers named Pulling Nails. It's basically a series of blended beers where he blends and ages them in oak barrels. This is a blend of four different beers, including a very good beer called Petch Ode Femir. And First mispronunciation uh, Femir. of the day. How do you spell it? How Are they ancient it? Tercios? How do you say it? I don't know. Well, then how do you know I'm going to pronounce it yet? It's, it says Pulling Nails on it. Yeah, I know more about Any it. Beer. I know more about it than what's on the label. Thanks. All right. So anyway, uh, Agent Oak for eighteen between eighteen and twenty four months, uh, released in two thousand sixteen, was this beer. So it's going to be skunked. I was going to say, so this is two year and a half year old beer. Uh, year yes, old beer. but you don't uh, need to worry about that. It will age beautifully as long as it was okay when it was bottled. There you go. Sweet. Yeah, and if you're not a uh, already reading our beer site, make sure you check out tenemu.com, T E N E M U.com. It's like half wheel, but for beer. That was a miss. What do you know? What you could have been aiming for the La Galera hat for all you know. Well, you missed that too, so. Well, it was in a metal case, so I didn't really have a shot at that one, did I? <laughs> all right, so while Brooks pours us some beer, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the top 25 before. Uh, we actually talk about numbers 25 through number one. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that our list a few years ago was very rigid in terms of what could be eligible and, and what would make the list. It had to be cigars that were released during that year or at least in the month prior. So if it was the 2016 list, that meant that it had to be stuff from 2016 or from December of 2015. That's now changed uh, in the world sort of post-August 8th, 2016 uh, with FDA. Um, cigars are coming out in a lot of different manners, and cigars tend to be coming out a lot later in the year. And so it means that it's oftentimes tougher for us to get cigars. I know if you look at our current review schedule, we have cigars probably scheduled right now that were purchased in December that aren't going to be reviewed until the middle of March at the very least. And we still have more cigars to purchase from 2018. So this is generally speaking a list of cigars that came out from 2018. There's going to be some stuff from 2017 on it. There's going to be some stuff from 2016 actually as well. And some of that also has to do, uh, as you'll see with some of the Cuban cigars, Habano Sose has got some weird distribution methods where they ship like 10 boxes to one country and then 10 boxes to another country. And then all of a sudden, six months later, there's 150 boxes in this country and, and then we're able to actually get some of those cigars um, and so there's been cigars that we've been waiting to consider for top 25 purposes uh, that finally got considered this year and, and a couple of them made it and one of them the Cuaba 20th anniversary is uh, still not eligible because it's still not out yet um, so maybe next year uh, for top 25 and uh, with that I think we're gonna have some beer and then Patrick's gonna tell you about how to leave a comment on Facebook mm -hmm. so again this is pulling nails pulling nails side project Maybe a bit past its prime, but good. Uh, no. Is it like tangerine or mandarin? Peach. Okay. Soy sauce. I could get there. Not right away, but I could get there. Chicken skin? <laughs> Fatty tuna. Yeah. All right, Patrick. So uh, you're going to be monitoring the comment section, and uh, assuming we don't have any type players, you're going to actually... We're going to take some comments today? We are. So uh, if you are watching us on Facebook, feel free to leave comments and questions. Uh, I will do my best to, to catch them. I know we've got a lot of people in the room already uh, who are watching and who are just saying hi. So thanks, everyone, for doing that. Even just say hello if you get uh, if you get in the room and want to give a quick wave or something like that. Uh, we will take regular intervals for some questions and comments. Uh, if you want to ask about a specific cigar, please feel free. Uh, you know, it, it, pretty much anything is fair game. I think the only one that maybe not is why didn't X make that because we make the list because 
there are some really i mean there were some spots that were really close and we consider first and second place was really close right how many how many do we have uh, there were th- 30 some odd there were 31 cigars i believe that were eligible for 2018 so six cigars were we all smoked and ended up not making any cut for 25 um, that's about where we've been for the last couple of years. I think right. one year there, there was as many as 35 or 36 cigars that were sort of in that consideration. Um, yeah, and the other problem is I don't – I mean, I can't tell you what you scored cigars as and, and vice versa. Right. So it, it's going to be somewhat helpful. These are the best 25, and I think that's a good ex- explanation for how we go about doing this. So um, when we review cigars at Half Wheel, uh, almost always at this point, it means that a singular person will smoke three cigars. So um, if Brooks is reviewing – say, uh, a Monte Cristo, he will smoke three Monte Cristos, he will turn in a score sheet, uh, we will average those scores out, and that will become the review that you see on Half Wheel. Uh, if it scores essentially a 91 or above, it's considered to be eligible for top 25 for that respective year, and then we will go back and we'll purchase three more of those cigars, we'll distribute them out to the other three people, so it's uh, Patrick and I, and then Brian Burt, uh, who's a former reviewer for us, but has stuck around for a couple of odds and ends, including being on the tasting panel for our top 25. So we'll each score the cigars using the same uh, format and score sheet that Brooks did. So there'll be a total of six uh, scores in the end, and then we average all of those together. Uh, Brooks' scores are averaged, or, or whoever's scores are averaged together to be one. So those three scores equal one score, and then uh, there's that's 25%, 25% from another person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So every cigar on here was smoked by all three of us plus Brian, and um, in almost every single case it meant that there was – at least six cigars were smoked in order to get to this conclusion. So it's a pretty thorough process, uh, at least I'd like to think, as opposed mm-hmm. to the, you know, just uh, deciding who gets on here because of who's the prettiest. Like well, yesterday. yeah, and I think one of the things that we've we've changed, just to highlight that, is really getting the other three people to smoke that cigar as quickly as possible after the initial review comes out, um, as opposed to having to wait for three months or six months, maybe, you, you know, not re- not – me not smoking a cigar that Brooks reviewed in January, I'm not getting to it until August, that can have some serious effect. And so I think that was a real nice way to consolidate and kind of tighten the scores a little bit. Yeah. All right. Anyone else getting, like, some burnt popcorn from the beer? Nope. Burnt popcorn. Well, you're sick, so you can't taste anything. Anymore. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to start this off. No burnt popcorn. Mm-mm. All right. Are you sick? Patrick? Yeah, burn popcorn. <laughs> so, we have 25 cigars on the list, and we start with number 25, which is the Leaf by James. Uh, it's a project that you may well know as the Leaf series at Island Jim Robinson of Leaf and Bean Strip in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, started several years ago. There's been several iterations of it. Arguably the most famous is uh, the Leaf by Oscar, which is the one that comes wrapped in a tobacco leaf and has absolutely exploded in the retail marketplace in the last couple of years. This year, a new project was released, uh, Leaf by James, and that is James Brown of Black Label Trading Company and Fabrica Oveja Negra, which is in Esteli, the the factory that he is a partner in and makes uh, all the Black Label portfolio, Black Work Studio, as well as a number of other brands. And this was a really interesting cigar for a lot of reasons. When you have collaborative projects, uh, it's interesting to try and pull apart the two parts of the cigar, meaning like what did the blender bring to it and what did the maybe the brand owner or, you know, what, if they're two, both blenders, kind of what were, if they left any signature marks on, on the cigar. And for me, James Brown definitely left his signature marks uh, on the cigar. It's, it's really nicely full-bodied, uh, nicely complex, well-balanced, uh, just an enjoyable, enjoyable smoke. It's a single Vitola, uh, about a, it's a Toro size. Also features the uh, the unique bands that are made from tobacco stems in Honduras, uh, and then printed on with the black sheep uh, on center or front and center, which is the name of the factory where they were made. Fabrico Veja Negra is black sheep. Uh, so yeah, just a really enjoyable, full-bodied cigar. And one that I thought was a really well-received addition to the Leaf line, which is seemingly everywhere now. Yeah, certainly um, if you had to look at brands and and particularly singular lines of brands that have exploded onto the scene in the last five years, I don't think there's any question that Leaf uh, by Oscar is is that brand. I mean, it went from being a house cigar to being in 
four or five hundred stores and I thought it was in the thousands. Yeah. yeah, well now it's in the thousands. But yeah. I mean it went from a house cigar to four or five hundred stores in, in eighteen months. It was crazy. Right. Um and it was really like in the back of that eighteen months. It wasn't like it was, you know, hundred month a hundred stores here, hundred stores here. It was slow, 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 and then all of a sudden everywhere. Right. Um but yeah, and, and Leaf by James and uh, there's a new one. I know we haven't reviewed it yet, but Leaf by Omar, which is actually uh, from La Corona, the factory best known for making Hirochi Urbana cigars. Um, and then obviously Leaf by Esteban. And there's one other one, correct? Uh, as far as in the Leaf series? Yeah. There was Leaf by Noel. There yeah. was Leaf by Esteban. I want to say there was a third one in there. No, I, think there I think we're at four now with uh, the Leaf by Omar. No, that would be five, because Oscar was the third one. Ah, huh. Yeah, there's Leaf by Noel. There's Leaf by Noel. Yeah. Noel Rojas, Esteban Disla, Oscar, James. Okay. And then Omar. And then Omar. So five. That will be the fifth. Yeah. If I'm counting. Right yeah, now. yeah. No, we're we're definitely at, at least five. Yeah. Um, Anthony just chimed in. Amazing use of Pennsylvania broadleaf. Congrats, James and Jim. Definitely, and that pretty much sums it up. I mean. Uh, you know, James Brown definitely has a a signature style, I think you could say, that comes out of Black Works, and it was definitely present uh, in this cigar. I'd be interested to see if they put out more sizes, too. I don't know if you could get much smaller, given the use of Pennsylvania Broadleaf and, and how the burn characteristics would work. Um, I don't know. I mean, those Lanceros, that, um, that Leaf um, Maduro uh, Lancero, which I think was on our list a couple years ago, was absolutely Oscar. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So we'll see where we go. Um, uh, Seth says Brooks is just chilling. I love it. He is just chilling. That's that's what Brooks does. He just chills. He comes in and is just. I enjoyed that cigar. Master. I enjoyed that cigar quite a bit, actually. Yeah, I uh, enjoyed uh, just about everything in that series. And Island Jim, one of the nicest guys, one of the greatest guys, uh, and one of the best guys to take a photograph of if you ever need to. Which reminds me, we really should have. We got to give Island Jim a, a hello. So wahoo! Well, yeah, he makes great uh, jerky too. Pineapple jerky, that, this is true. This There's is probably true. still some in the office from two years ago. Really? Where? I don't know. Is there it? Yeah. All Moving right. Moving on. Number 24 is the CAO Zacalo from General Cigar Company. It is a 6x60 six cigar, which uses a Mexican San Andreas wrapper. Zacalo is a reference, as you can see on the band that's on the screen, but Zacalo is a reference to uh, one of the most famous squares in Ciudad de Mexico, uh, which is Mexico City, and uh, the, the square is named Zacalo. It has a gigantic flag in it, which is uh, one of these very popular things to do in the country of Mexico. It's uh, another CAO that's arrived on our list. I would say that CAO has been a pleasant surprise if we have to sort of look back at the last eight or so years. I remember when General Cigar Company, they didn't buy CAO, but they, uh, they were... CEO was acquired uh, by Henry Wittermans, um, and sorry, there's some technical issues going on for the you know 18th time today. Uh, CEO was acquired by Henry Wittermans, and uh, which is owned by Scandinavian Tobacco Group. They then merged with Swedish Match, which included General Cigar Company. So many people believe that General bought CAO. That's actually not the case. Uh, but General uh, took sort of ownership of CAO in 2010, and most people thought CAO was going to sort of die or that was at least the comments on the internet general was going to ruin it it was never going to be the same and, and in fact it may have not really be been the same at this point but general now has a brand in ceo that is the second largest in its portfolio and it's obviously up against some pretty uh, stout competitors with brands like cohiba macanudo partigas excuse me lagori come on in the mix and so the fact that ceo has become the second most successful brand in terms of sales for them is is absolutely incredible and in terms of putting out good cigars i think ceo is probably the the leader for general cigar company um in terms of uh at least uh, as far as we're concerned and, and certainly if you look at the consensus and other sorts of things so zacalo is the latest in the list it may not be as good as amazon basin but it's certainly a very good and as always with general cigar seemingly always with general cigar it's also priced extremely well. one of the most uh, the least expensive cigars on the the, the list this year and, and also a, a pretty big one in a six by 60 at that yeah i think um you know number one i've really come to appreciate mexican tobacco uh in the last couple of years and so that always gets me interested in a cigar uh you know i struggle with the six by 60 i think like probably some of us do most of us do not our favorite size but there are some six by sixties on this list and uh and yeah i remember 
I think this. I think the year that CAO had moved over to the general booth was my first trade show, and I distinctly. Like 2011. No, well, ten maybe. No, 2010. 11. CAO still had their own booth. Okay, so it was 11. So maybe it was my second trade show. Uh, no, I guess it would have been my first trade show. Anyways, uh, but I I distinctly remember looking at the future and just wondering what was going to happen. Well, that was Osa Soul and Traviata. Uh, Oh, La Traviata, and Man- La Traviata and La Traviata Maduro were uh, the last two sort of projects of old CAO. Right, but it was they were riding that high of yeah. They were La Traviata cigar. had done very well. It was a very very good cigar. Uh, La Traviata and Maduro, I think maybe was rushed if we had to be quite honest, and certainly didn't have the impact that the original one did. Largely because it, it debuted at the trade show, and then only a couple months later was when CAO was essentially shutting itself down, at least the the Nashville office and moving into general. But yeah, Osa Soul was that. That was the release. They had the uh, the humidors that turned up to eleven. I mean, there was a lot of like head scratching. I, I think General wasn't entirely sure what to do with CAO, and, and they certainly have figured that out. Yeah. Um, and it, it didn't take them that long, um, but I think you have to give them credit. Uh, certainly, I remember what 2010 was like, and, and I don't think anyone would have seen this coming. Yeah. No, I actually you you mentioned that they were wondering what to do with it. I remember being at General Cigar Dominicana shortly after all the transaction went down and speaking with Dan Carr and he was talking about kind of some of the early laying the early map of what CAO's future looked like and it's interesting to see where it's gotten now seven years later yeah yeah I was impressed with the uh the six by 60 I was uh I was really liked the the flavors that came out of it and uh I was I was really happy with that I wouldn't smoke a bunch of them um because of just the size but uh, in terms of the flavor they was uh, it was wonderful there you go. Real quick, uh, Anthony just chimed in. Says that the Leaf series was Noel, Oscar, Esteban, James, and Omar. And then there's the P and J, which is a Costa Rican production, but not a Leaf yeah. uh, release. But definitely wanted to shout out Island Jim doing so much for Pittsburgh cigar culture. Good comment. All right, Brooks. All right, number twenty three is the Foundation Chest Collectors Humidor Corona Gorda. Now, the cigars inside this uh, wonderful chest, which, by the way. Uh, was a uh, uh, was a uh, commemoration. They was built to commemorate the uh, company's uh, new headquarters, which they opened up in the middle of a tobacco field. Uh, it was a uh, it was a looked like a chest that uh, Jorge de Monterey produced in the 1920s, and uh, basically opens up and there's little pieces up, uh, you know, uh, little uh, uh, drawers that o- or uh, uh, boxes that open up that are connected. The whispering. Keep going. Uh, the uh, the cigars inside look just like the uh, tabernacle uh, of the same side uh, size, but uh, the the blend is quite different. Um, the uh, the the tobaccos used, according to uh, Nicholas, the tobacco used is exactly the same tobacco, but the ratios are different than the tabernacle that it looks like. The interesting thing, of course, the the uh, the bands are all the same. It looks basically the same, same size. So you have to really uh, know that what you're smoking is exactly what it is. Uh, so I enjoyed it uh, immensely. Um, the there is some significant difference between the, that and the Tabernacle um, that I smoked, and um, it was uh, it was very very good. I just wish that uh, there was some way to differentiate them. Yeah, there's zero way to differentiate them, um, and I, I don't understand why there wasn't like a specialty band put on. Like how hard? W- I mean, I'm the, I think the one that complains the most about having oh. One of the humidors needs to get filled. Um, I think I'm the one that complains the most about having, like, the secondary band and then a foot band. But it would be helpful here because, as we've pointed out multiple times with the cigar, it's the same size. It's the same tobacco components, which likely means it's the same wrapper. Um, it's just probably the filler blend that's changed, and there's zero chance as soon as those cigars leave the humidor that you would ever be able to tell which one's which. Yeah, this is a really, really good uh, example of how something like just changing the filler ratio to fillers, you know, things of that nature, can really change the the the, the profile of a cigar. It or was just a, telling people it that it's different. It was a significant different. change, assuming that he wasn't lying. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> it's the cigar business. <laughs> Uh, but a good cigar, nonetheless, and uh, and probably one of the better packaging items amongst our top 25. Indeed. Indeed, yeah. And on the packaging awards list two years ago, or not this past year, but the, the year before that. I believe at number five, if I'm not mistaken. All right. Anything else for Foundation? I'm done. What about you, yeah. Patrick? Yeah, I I just really have to give uh, Nick Melillo a lot of credit for what he's done with Foundation. 
He's he's put out a number of well received cigars, built up a real solid fan base. This one is an incredible cigar, uh, and seemingly now he's moved on to the Havana C number one forty two project, which looks to be getting good reviews and good results uh, from what I hear out there. So, really, just done a nice job with it, and I definitely wish I had more of those Corona Gorgeous laying around, and I. It always reminds There's me. There's a ton in the humidor behind, behind you. Well, then I'll steal Take some. Take some home. Uh, but it also reminds me, it's a great reason why you should always have some blank bands on hand. Yep. Uh, you can order them. For Please not. don't steal those because we don't have right. a ton of those left in the office. But, uh, no, you can get some. And it just, for me, it's one of those reminders that you can add little notes to your cigars uh, really easily. Just, you know, what year it's from, where it was bought, if it's a special release. And then when you go back and look for them a year to ten years later... Uh, you now know exactly what you have there. So, all right. Next on the list is the number twenty-two cigar, and I believe the only one without bands on here, and that would be the Illusione La Grande Classe Rex or Rex Two Point Oh. So this is a combination of two different projects, and I think if I'm being quite honest, it doesn't really make a ton of sense as far as what actually came out. So. Illusione, uh, way, not that way back ago, but a handful of years ago, launched a project called Le Grand Class A, and it was on the Illusione website, and Dion Giolito refused to answer questions about it, and eventually there was a cigar that came out, and it was a cigar that was packaged in a cardboard box, uh, no bands, uh, and it was described as this new program where Dion was going to have cigars that were not necessarily Illusione. They were going to ship from his retail store in Reno called Fumare, and you could buy them through Fumare, and... Ultimately, the only one, at least to my knowledge, that ever came about was was the original Le Grand Classe. And then there was also a cigar called Rex, which was um, a, a small petite Corona that was also available only in Fumari. That was banded as an Illusione product, or not banded because it didn't have bands, but it was described as an Illusione product. It was basically sort of um, the sister cigar to Rothschild's in a way. It came in 50-count boxes like Rothschild's, and it was, uh, once again, limited to his retail operation. Um, last year, or in 2017, I guess, actually, if we're, we're being clear about this, he launched uh, a whole bunch of new cigars for part of uh, the 10th anniversary of Illusione. Le Grand Classe Rex was part of that, and it is being sold at stores that are uh, not just Fumare. Um, and it's some sort of hybrid of the two of them, but uh, at least as far as the cigar is concerned and the, the concept, it, it doesn't really make... A ton of sense, except for the fact that Rex is a reference to one of his good customers at Fumari. Um, and from what I understand, he the, the customer is a big fan of this particular cigar. And, and obviously we are too because it is the number 22 cigar on uh, this year's list. Any thoughts, Brooks? I know you're a big fan of Rex. I love the Rex, yeah. I love this one. Um, you know, I, 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 find, I very rarely find an Illusion that I, uh, Illusione that I, uh, that I don't like. And... Uh, you know these are these are great cigars and, and something that people should really. Um, he's got the whole medium body, full flavor thing down, and uh, if you're looking for something like that, which is what I prefer, then uh, Illusione is the way to go. Yeah, I remember when I think the three of us were all at Fumari a couple of years ago for Dion's holiday pop up shop with Craft, uh, a wonderful beer, wine, spirits uh, store in Reno, and he had some of the original Rex, which were made for his attorney, if I'm not mistaken. A customer, customer, mm-hmm. or ones. yeah, mm-hmm. those are here somewhere too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I remember getting some of those and going like, "This is phenomenal!" And I wanted more of them. I wanted fifty count boxes by as many as I could carry out. Unfortunately, didn't get to get any. Uh, but I remember that was a really great cigar. So whenever I hear that word "Rex" tied into an Illusione release, it, it kind of piques my interest and makes me think back to some really good times, that both with a cigar and that I think we had uh, together. So, yeah. Good times. Good stuff. Moving on to number 21. It is the McAuliffe Grande Bold Ligero 552L. Not the smoothest of names that you've probably ever seen, but it does tell you a good bit about the cigar, particularly the words Bold and Ligero, although it's not quite everything about the cigar. One of the things that when McAuliffe did this project, they wanted to show off the what they refer to as the essence of Ligero and not just make a strength bomb. Uh, or something with a ton of power and a ton of pepper. They really wanted to show off what the leaf uh, can do for a blend. And I think that's what helped this cigar score so well, is that it would be easy just to think, oh, this thing is nothing but strength and power, and you're going to have a nicotine hangover afterwards, uh, and you're just going to 
make this thing an absolute uh, firecracker of a cigar. That's not it at all. It's incredibly complex, incredibly balanced, incredibly deep, uh, and a cigar definitely worth trying from a brand who has gotten a fair amount of uh, traction in the last couple of years uh, in a number of stores across the country. So really was pleasantly surprised by that, uh, or by this particular cigar. And uh, like I say, for, for a cigar that tries to tell you something about it in the name, it actually kind of doesn't do as good of a job as you might think. Yeah, and also kind of confusing because there's a whole mess of lines. I think it was like 28 Vitol or S SKUs that they came out with at the show as part of these new Grande line. Fortunately, they put a secondary band, so you can tell that this one's the Lajero, and obviously it's the Robusto size. But um, I haven't smoked. This is actually the only uh, of the Grande and the only really new McAuliffe I've smoked since 2017. So... Um, it was hit or miss that I smoked one before you reviewed it, Patrick, and did not like it. And I smoked one after you reviewed it and found that one to be a bit better. They were not from the same batch. So, mm. and, and obviously it was a couple months in between, but, um, sure. the, the second one was better. And, and obviously, uh, collectively speaking, good enough to get into the top 25, which is not an easy task. This is the first time a cow's been in the top 25 on us. Mm -hmm. And, um, welcome to the party. Indeed, it's a lot of fun. This is the biggest pro the biggest uh, surprise on my list. Anyway, I was uh, not I was not thinking that it was going to be huge. It's your hostage note. <laughs> uh huh. Um, but uh, it was I was surprised with it. Very 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 good cigar. I enjoyed it immensely, and um, uh, was not as bold or Lejero uh, esque as I was expecting. Yeah, I think that was. I the look part forward that. to next year's review of Extra Lejero. That's awesome. <laughs> right. So speaking of parties and speaking of good times, uh, lots of people hanging out in our Facebook uh, chat. So if you are in, yeah, in our Facebook chat, if you're watching on YouTube and want to comment or leave a question, head on over to Facebook.com slash Half Wheel. That's the room that we're monitoring for comments and questions. Uh, lots of people hanging out. Uh, got Jack Tarano in there right now. Congrats to Jack on his new job with Espinoza. Uh, we've got a few other people in here, Tim and Ronnie and... All sorts of other people. Uh, so what's up, everybody? Remember, if you want to ask a question about a specific cigar that's on the list, feel free to or a comment. Uh, already got a number of guesses as to what the number one is going to be. Anyone get it right? Uh, I can almost guarantee nobody got it right. I can tell you nobody's gotten it right, but there was an interesting comment about uh, how good it seems like Lazone is doing so mm. far this year. Was that from Jack Tarani or from It was not from okay. Jack Tarani. Uh, surprisingly all right well number 20 is not uh, from lazona but it uh is the hit and run part droit almost robusto it is a collaboration from caldwell cigar company and room 101 and tobacco Lero william ventura is the ones producing the cigar which is the home of a lot of caldwell and room 101 blends it is uh part of the sort of map booth 2.0 um so the non-davidoff map booth it's uh, a very good cigar. I think a very good follow-up. Probably the best Room 101 I've had um, in, in a, a while, four or five years. Uh, and obviously, the rest of us really appreciated it. A little bit bolder, I would say, than what we typically find from Matt Booth, or at least what I typically find from Matt Booth. Um, and in a year in which uh, there was two different Connecticut cigars from Room 101 at the trade show, I appreciated that the company sort of went both directions, both a little bit milder than its sort of four to five out of 10 uh, body, and then a little bit stronger than, than that medium uh, profile that, that I typically pick up from Booth's products. Mr. Whittington. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was impressed with it. I didn't, uh, I liked it more than the, uh, than the first one, the first hit and run. Um, and um, I was impressed with the, uh, the stuff, the Cald Caldwell stuff. Um, you know, I like as as well, so it doesn't surprise me that uh, the two of them together produces something like this. Yeah, and and obviously with uh, Tobacco Lair, William Ventura, which is a factory that I've been seeing stuff from uh, sort of pre Caldwell back in the the days when it was much smaller, and and the brands that he was working with are much smaller. But now, obviously, I think a, a much more of a household name, um, and uh, you know, a, a factory that Dominican Republic that I think isn't as well known as uh, sort of the more uh, established and, and longer standing factories, but certainly is capable of producing some interesting cigars and also uh, perhaps most notably being able to produce a, a breadth and depth of cigars. Um, a lot of different flavor profiles coming out of it and some of the strongest cigars coming out of the DR are coming from that factory. 
Agreed. It's it's probably the factory and the DR that maybe most of my radar that I want to visit next, just because of how well they've done uh, for a number of companies in recent years. Uh, you know, the one of the things I always get a little concerned about is maybe having too many cooks in the kitchen sometimes, and this project definitely did not suffer from that. Uh, it seemed to be a, a really good collaboration between people that like hanging out, seem to have a similar mindset. Yeah, I reflected it. and also the word collaboration, I, it gets thrown around a lot in this industry. I'm, I think, on the more skeptical end of it. This is a, a cigar that is a collaboration, but also is a Room 101 product with Robert Caldwell, who's the same person who... Uh, distributes the product. It's coming from Tobacco Lair William Ventura, who makes the vast majority of Caldwell products and also is making quite a bit of the New Room 101 stuff. Uh, so it's not like there's new players kind of being involved. It's a whole bunch of the same people that work together uh, and, and, and are working together on a day-in, day-out basis. Indeed. So again, lots of people checking in here from the uh, chat room. Lots of guests are starting to go out. Richie Otero's saying hello. Uh, lots, of, lots of folks hanging out. So if you're having audio problems or anything like that, let us know. Uh, we'll try and get Charlie to speak up a little bit more, apparently. He does get quiet sometimes. I'm sick. It's true. And I am trying not to get sick, so. That's actually not true. I'm not sick, but. Well. You get the speak microphone. For your, speak for yourself. Too close. All right. 19. Uh, comes an interesting project that came from a company who has been highly known as being a Dominican Republican or Dominican Republic oriented Dominican Republican. Dominican Republicans, uh, Dominican Republic oriented company, but branched out into Nicaragua for a puro, and that is the Aging Room Small Batch Puro Sepa Puro Sepa Rondo, and I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, it's been a long day, so I don't know if all my pronunciations are coming out right. But this one is uh, from Rafael Nadal and Aging Room, uh, made at Placencia Cigars. It's a Nicaraguan puro, uses tobacco from four different regions in the country. And uh, the name means pure blood. And what can I say? I mean, it was just a well-balanced, well-crafted, uh, seemingly very well-thought-out cigar. Um, I haven't, I'm not going to lie and say I've enjoyed everything that Rafael Nadal has done. Uh, certainly some cigars hit my palate better than others. But this one really showed some pretty masterful blending, in my opinion, uh, with good tobaccos and a cigar that, for a guy who's not known for using a lot of Nicaraguan tobacco, really i'd say hit a home run with this one yeah it's a it's a good cigar um also like i think one of the more uh the, one of the pricier um cigars of uh the um uh, of the adrian the por adrian right. portfolio yeah no not necessarily of the list although it's probably in the top half there uh, fun fact: Cigar manufacturers don't call me during the top twenty-five, uh, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's a good cigar. Uh, in, in I think if you took the bands off and asked people what it was, their aging room would not be uh, what would have come to mind on my end. And, and obviously, it makes sense. I mean, it's not being made by Hochi Blanco, which is the longtime collaborator and responsible for the vast majority of aging room boutique blends, Oliveros, whatever right. we're calling ourselves these days, cigars that have been on the market. Berks, still alive? Indeed, yes. I was going to say that I agree with you. This was not uh, this would not strike me as a uh, as an aging room product um, when I you know if you smoked it blind, um, it was uh, it was very very good and um, I was uh, I was very impressed with the uh, the balance specifically that it had mm -hmm. in the uh, in the profile with the flavors uh, flavors were really really well balanced with the strength and uh, I was uh, I was really impressed with it. Yeah, I mean it's Rafael Nadal. I think has, has really shown that he can he can make a good cigar and he can make a good sense of flavor and strength and balance you know he has his palate assuming he's getting everything run through him at some level seems to be pretty much in line with what i find to be enjoyable with cigars so i've been appreciating and enjoying a lot of the things that he has had a hand in a lot more in recent years so all right number 18 is the uh, edmundo dantes conde 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 getting there <coughs> bellicoso uh, this is the uh, third, this is the uh, third uh, release in the uh, Amundi Dantes Marca, the uh, uh, Habano Essays, uh, Cuban Marca, obviously. Um, this was a uh, release, as with the other two, uh, in Mexico. It was a Mexico exclusive that was sent to Mexico, and they are uh, the Mexico has a some issues with the um, with the. Uh, they used to have issues with the trademark. Trademark, thank you. Yes, they've I believe worked the them out. Right, um, that uh, so they couldn't use uh, Monte Cristo, 
And so they made up this, uh, this brand called Imunde Dantes, which is uh, uh, taken from the same um, book, the uh, Canto Monte Monte Cristo. Uh, and uh, this was a, uh, the shortest uh, of the three Vitolas in the line and um, was actually released in 2016. Uh, presumably, uh, no, it was released, we, we, but we were December of sixteen. But we were putting it on our list. Well, you didn't this re- year because you didn't review it until seventeen. We didn't review it until seventeen. So, uh, very good. I enjoyed the uh, one hundred and nine quite a bit uh, more. But this is uh, to me is uh, got quite a few um, redeeming qualities that I think that with a little bit of age will uh, will uh, will turn it into uh, something close to that. Uh, one hundred and nine is still one of my the condo one hundred and nine conde 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 conde. conde. 109 is still one of my best cigars, uh, Cuban cigars that I've smoked. Um, this is not that good yet, but uh, I'm hoping that a little bit of age will uh, will get it there. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is interesting when you talk about cult cigars or ones that have this kind of bizarre following. The Edmundo Dante's lines really seem to pick that up over the last five-ish years. I think ever since the first one came out. Yeah. I mean, it, the 109, the 109 was fantastic. I yeah, mean, it was the 109 just, it was, was a great cigar. It's in that Vitola that for kind of stupid reasons people really like it's it's a regular vitola but just with a slightly rounded cap if we called it a, a long torpedo no one would care but because it's a 109 it's it's designated as something special we certainly have not uh hurt the propagation of that popularity that cigar i think would have been good no matter what vitola it was blended in the fact that it was a new brand from habanos and kind of a weird concept like why is Hibanos, history and yeah why is Habanos putting out something and it's a regional so like why were they even considering monte cristo as a regional and there's there's a whole bunch of different things at play there uh and also all three of the cigars have been quite good i think this is potentially the worst of the three and still good enough to finish in the top 20 also it's still quite available i was in mexico uh in mexico city uh in the fall and it was all over the duty freeze um in the airport and, and certainly also in some cigar lounges within the city so they're not cheap because tobacco taxes in mexico are quite right. expensive but um, if you do want to find them, all you got to do is go to the Mexico airport and walk into pretty much any duty free, and it's there's your sort of standard fare of Cuban cigars, and then Edmundo Dantes were stacked up at about three hundred and fifty dollars a box. And you didn't call me why? Uh, cause uh, minutes mm. ran out of minutes on my phone. You texted me. Ran out of text. Were the one hundred nines stacked up to the wall too? Because no. I could. The one hundred nines were a couple of those. The one hundred nines were stacked up to the wall. It, we would be having a much different story. Right. Uh. Then I would know why he didn't call. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. uh, I couldn't afford the minutes. I'd spent all the money on, right, on yeah, 109. Yeah. 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 yeah, no. Um, a good cigar, and uh, there's some debate about whether or not there will be another Edmundo Dantes or whether Edmundo Dantes will go out into the rest of, of the world. Uh, we'll, we shall see. Um, but um, They did say that it was no, no, more, no longer an exclusive for who? Mexico, correct? Right, yeah. Well, that this is the thing, though, is who said that? Uh, the I don't know. Yeah. They. I remember hearing talk that it, it, was, it was done, but it it was done in as a Mexican <laughs> regional. They talk a lot. Them. They. they uh, them. That person. That it was done as a Mexican regional. Many people. And it may expand to the rest of the world. I, yeah, who knows? But I mean, again. But it's Cuba, so. Exactly. Um, I, at the very least, Edmundo and uh, at, at least as of this fall, were still for sale, and um, Habanos is selling Monte Cristos within Mexico now, or at least they are available in the stores, so. Um, perhaps the end, perhaps not, but uh, only time will tell. Indeed. Uh, so, again, if you're watching on Facebook, lots of comments going on, lots of chat, lots of questions. Uh, i got Skip Martin in the room right now, Richie Otero, uh, Danny Vasquez is in there. So a couple questions. Uh, first and foremost, is there a halftime show? No. Not today. Because apparently Cobra Starship is showing up to do it. Okay. So just a heads up, that's from uh, the folks who are at Havana Lounge and Cigar. Uh, Brian Burnett wants a quick recap of what the beer is because I think he tuned in late. Uh, beer is pulling nails four from uh, blend four from a uh, side project in St. Louis, Missouri. I have a feeling I might need so a bottle here before pulling nails number four, blend four, but blend number four, blend four, blend four, yeah, blend number four, yeah. But right. we just so it's not it's not blended four side projects. It's it's the fourth blend of this beer <clears throat> made by side project. Correct. The brewery is. Side, Side project. project, yes. The name of the beer is Pulling Nails, number four. Blend four. Blend four. <laughs> yeah, it's the fourth there you batch go. of it. Not the third. Uh, it might have some of the third. Fifth. Yeah. Ian Fan, I hope I'm saying your name right, wants to know, is there any Lanceros on this list? 
No. And you'll, or are you just going to give it away like that? There's are, not. Are I mean, sure? yeah, I'm pretty sure. I, yeah, I don't believe there's, I don't believe so. And that's kind of interesting. I mean, it, there's always a Lancero debate about are they popular, are they worth making? There's a debate about whether or not they're popular? Well, you know what I mean. Like, there's. <laughs> Does he, though? Mm. <laughs> See, and, and here's the thing. Like, Charlie can never just agree with me. It's it's great. Or with anybody. Or no. with anybody, really. It's not like really. He's, he's programmed to just, like, disagree. But, but I they don't aren't remember popular. smoking a lot of Lanceros in the last year. Um, I, I think there have been less this past year than there had been in the prior years. I know there was some discussion after IPSPR 2016 about how many Lanceros there were. Right. As someone who I feel confident in saying has smoked just about as many Lanceros as anyone walking this planet has. Um, yeah. Uh, they don't sell, and so and they're hard to make, and they're expensive, and they don't sell. And it seems like every few years we go through the cycle where cigar manufacturers decide to put out Lanceros and sort of droves, and so there's a dozen, dozen and a half new ones, and then they get reminded that really no matter how good the Lancero is, no matter how well it's priced, um, no matter how many people tell you it's my favorite size, those people don't go out and buy boxes of Lanceros. And so... Um, uh, you know, I wish there was more of them. Um, but also, like, there was a, a time, and I, I certainly was pushing for this, where it was like every single blend coming in a Lancero, and half of them weren't great. Like, they, they right. weren't the best expression of the blend. I think it works sometimes, but there have been plenty of times when it's been like, oh, you know what? I remember when Brooks, you and I were first getting to know each other. Um, it was always like that. It was like, oh man, imagine if they had this in a Corona Gordon. Imagine if they had this in a Lancero, and then someone had this really bad idea. Imagine if they had it in a Nympha, which is even thinner <laughs> than a Lancero. I heard Nymphas <laughs> were coming back, and uh, and then uh, we would smoke them, and it'd be like, oh well, it doesn't really burn, and it isn't as flavorful, and it cost twelve dollars, and the other one was nine dollars, and right, it's not a magic vitola that makes everything taste perfect. Nope, but the football is. This is true. All right, I think we probably should get to seventeen, and then we can take some more questions. Yeah, Matthias just says he'd love to see us argue about cigars like we just argue about beer. So, yeah, stay tuned. More coming. That's probably happening. All right. On, on to number seventeen. Number seventeen is the Liga Provada number nine Corona Viva from Drew Estate. Uh, there are a couple things we should get out of the way. First, that picture got demolished in Photoshop. Second, uh, mm-hmm. that was on, on me, not on Brooks. Second, uh, this is not the tenth anniversary. Two thousand eighteen was not the tenth anniversary of Liga Provada was in fact the 12th anniversary and uh third uh when this cigar came out at cigars international in uh, may it was soft launch there and then it was released to the the country at the ipc Bear convention and trade show in july but the ones that we reviewed were from the boxes in may i purchased a box when i was at cigars international i came back we opened the box up photographed it i smoked one just because i was curious it had been a long time since there had been a new regular production league bravada size and I always liked the Undercrown Corona Viva, which is their sort of take on a Corona Gorda. The cigar was initially terrible. And about three weeks later, it was time for me to review it. So I pulled three more out of the box and lit up the first one and found a cigar that was completely different. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, the cigars that were shipped to uh, Pennsylvania for the soft launch event weren't in the best of shape. They certainly probably shouldn't have been smoked during the event. And... Um, as little as three weeks. Who knows if it if it took a week and a half or, or two weeks or three weeks, but certainly by that three week period, the cigar had turned a page, and, and ever since then they've been smoking great. Um, I think it's a fantastic addition to sort of Drew Estate's most popular non traditional line, at least as far as like popularity, not necessarily in buying sales. Um, and I'm glad that we are seeing some newer Liga Provada sizes for number nine and T52. It's been a while. I know they have a lot more up their sleeve in terms of things that they would like to try. And it's a reminder that well, Liga may not be the same as it once was, um, it still can be a very good cigar. Um, and uh, I would wholeheartedly recommend the number nine Corona Viva. And with that, we can talk about why this isn't the 10th year of Liga Provada. <laughs> or something, I don't know. I'll leave that one to you. Yeah, I, I agree. I, just like saying that Lanceros aren't magical Vitolas, uh, I was really impressed by what the Corona Viva did to the number nine blend. Uh, so that size really did something well, did something good for that cigar. And I really liked all three of the sizes that were new this year. But for some reason, the Corona Viva just seemed to hit a little bit more of a sweet spot than the other ones for my palate. Uh, definitely good to see that, that blend in a little smaller format. Uh, a little quicker to smoke, but really, it brought me back to some of the earlier days of Liga Provada. Yeah, easily the uh, the best uh, new Liga Provada that I've smoked in in a, in a while. Um, number nine, that is. Um, 
Well, yeah, which which makes sense because like it was the only in the one in Petit Corona <laughs> and the machine made uh, cigar. That's right. Like I said, <laughs> the best the best out of those. Uh, but my point uh, is that um, hot takes from Bruce. I, uh, I I think I agree completely with uh, with Patrick. You know, back in the day when when Liga was 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 tearing it up um, long long time ago. Uh, you know, I would smoke a uh, let's say a, uh, uh, a number nine, and it would you know it blow me away. Um, and um, th- th- those days, you know, haven't been that way for a while. This uh, this really rekindled my love of, of of that blend. It's just really really fantastic, and the um, the uh, the size is great too. So love it all. There you go. So for number sixteen, not going to go too far away from La Gran Fabrica Drew Estate. It's the Herrera Esteli Ink to Me Exception. Now this is the second cigar. It was made for smallbatchcigars.com and Maximar Ultimate Cigars in Orange, California. The original one, the Herrera Esteli Inc. to me, came out in the summer of 2016. It was a celebration of the retailer's fifth anniversary. And then Willie Herrera decided to reblend it for a re-release in 2018 using a little bit higher priming uh, on the Ecuadorian Habana wrapper, making a little bit darker cigar, and he uh, played with the press a little bit as well. So it's still a 6x46 Corona Gorda. Uh, there's unfortunately not a way to tell the two cigars apart if you're putting them side by side, uh, unless you just happen to get a lighter and a darker version, uh, and you can see the color differential. The press you can see a little bit as well. This actually came out in the end, right at the end of 2017, December 2017. Missed last year's list uh, because of timing, but I can tell you this: when I s- first smoked this cigar, and that's like the first of the three uh, that I smoked for the review. I was pretty much on smallbatchcigars.com to order a box. I thought it was that good. It was incredibly rich, uh, just an incredibly flavorful profile uh, cigar I really loved. And what can I say? I mean, it, it's kind of like if you're a Willie Herrera fan and you like what he can do with a blend, especially the original uh, Herrera Esteli blend, this is a great uh, offshoot of that and one that I just I really enjoyed smoking. Uh, and just Redux did a couple of weeks ago, months yeah, ago? Yeah, one of the last Redux of 2018. Yeah, and it's still incredible, still burning and smoking incredibly well. So uh, that's number 16, the Herrera Esteli Ink to Me Exception. And if you're wondering about the name of the of Ink to Me, uh, it was a company who the owners sold some stock in, and that's what started the cigar store. Yeah, interesting story. And the second time that we've had uh, one of the small batch Herrera Esteli exclusives, make the list so i think they're two for two now on uh her Esteli exclusives on our top 25 and uh, they certainly have a lot of other exclusives they have a whole bunch from caldwell and, and they've got some from davidoff uh and, and plenty of others and uh, certainly one of the quickest stores when it comes to ordering and then putting cigars in the mail because that's what happens when you're located right next to a post office you can get the cigars in the post box real quick Indeed. Which is appreciated. Great store. But back to the cigar. <laughs> the uh, Herrera, uh, Herrera Esteli line has, uh, you know, they, they've been a lot of cigars that, that I've enjoyed in that brand, overall brand. This is the best one that I've smoked out of all of them. Um, it's, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's phenomenal. It's any number of things that you could say. Uh, and like you said, I had smoked one, um, not I mean, before this one, I had smoked one a few months ago, maybe. And. Uh, it was good, but th- this one, you know, it's just getting better. It's just getting better, and I would suggest that you go out and buy some immediately if you can. It's wonderful. Are they still in stock? Don't know. Okay. Maybe uh, small batch guys can. Maybe they're stocked up. Help us out. Floor, help us out. Floor to ceiling in the Mexican duty freeze. Great. So head on. Head on down there. <laughs> if you have minutes. <laughs> just have some text left from Singular. All right. I think we should probably move on to number fifteen. All right, number fifteen is a, a uh, the it's a cigar. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the, uh, this beer 15... is forty-seven proof, by the way, according to how Brooks is. It's only like <clears> number fifteen and a half percent is the ABV. Me, Querida, Firecracker, Look at Dunbarton uh, Tobacco and Trust, uh, Steve Saka's uh, relatively new uh, brand, uh, uh, a company that um, this is a. I, I want to say the newest. It's not though. It's but, not. Uh, it's it's a. Uh, it's no, a no. Entry it, in. it is actually the newest. Oh, okay. I mean, it depends on if you consider the second batch of Romacraft ones newer. But I believe this I don't. Is, I believe this is the last one, <laughs> the last new manufacturer to come out. Uh, this is a, a series called the Firecracker series, which was made for uh, the um, 
I want to say smoke shop. Well, hold on a second. Let's see. Help me out here, Charles. Two guys smoke shop. Two guys, yeah, in New Hampshire. Two guys smoke shop in New Hampshire. Um, I can remember smoking the first one of those series from uh, Humble Brag. Don Carlos. Pepin. Pepin, yeah. Not Carlos. <laughs> well, when you interrupt me, I <laughs> tend to stop talking. Uh, Don uh, Pepin, which was uh, wonderful. Blue, blue label on that one. But this one is, uh, is very, very good. Um, I enjoyed it. it I, I don't, it, again, one, not one of my favorite sizes um, because I, I find that they tend to get too hot for me at the end. Um, but this one did had no issues whatsoever with that. And uh, I was uh, very impressed with it. And it just goes along with uh, Sokka's stuff. You know, Sokka's pro- you know, producing some really great <coughs> cigars. Stuff. stuff. And uh, this, is, uh, this is absolutely one of them. Uh, if you like the smaller sizes, then I absolutely think you should go buy some. Uh, I don't think they're in stock anymore either. Okay. No, they sold out <laughs> yeah. real quick. Yeah, no, it's a it's a really good cigar. Um, and I think the last few firecrackers have actually been really good. The Fratello, mm-hmm. the Cro-Magnon, the Micarita. Um, and so, yeah, certainly uh, seems like a, a good line um, or a good group of cigars, a good series. They're always extremely well-priced. It helps that New Hampshire, at least for the moment, doesn't have a tax on cigars. Um, they're always smaller. And in the middle of uh, you know June, July, when they show up here to the office, when it's 115 degrees outside, it's always great to have a nice three and a half by 50 or so cigar. Right. Um, I know that you're you know even worse when it comes to the temperature in the summer. So, um, what was once sort of like a, a gimmick, I think is probably the best way to describe it, um, is now turned into a full fledged series. And, and one of um, one one thing we look forward to every year, mm-hmm. um, at least uh, at this site, and I think this is the second one to place in the top 25. Indeed, yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't necessarily call it a gimmick, maybe a novelty or something like that, but a cigar made really to sell, you know, to tie into the 4th of July with the fuse cap and really enjoyable. I know a lot of guys that I smoke with uh, back in Phoenix have bought these by the box, two, three boxes, whatever they could get their hands on, uh, and they enjoy them quite regularly, so a right. very good cigar. Are we going to take any questions or are we going to get to 14? No, I think we should go to 14. Okay, so... Number 14, and continuing our trend of revisionist history when it comes to anniversaries, is the Rocky Patel Tavacusa Toro, which was allegedly made for the 10th anniversary of the Tavacusa factory, which did not take place in 2018 because it hasn't happened yet, to my knowledge. Um, but the Tavacusa Toro is from uh, Tavacusa, which is Tabacalera Via Cubana SA, which is a partnership between uh, Rocky Patel and uh, Emil Corpres uh, Castro. Um, who at one point worked uh, with the Garcia family back when um, they were opening up their factories in Nicaragua. And it's oftentimes referred to by Rocky himself as sort of my boutique factory, which I think is more of a reference to the fact of the how big some of the other factories that make cigars for Rocky Patel are. Um, and I found this to be one of the better Rockies I've smoked um, in the last four or five years. And that's saying something because Rocky's actually shown up on our list, I think, three out of the last four years. And always, you know, one or two cigars from the company every year seems to score 91, 92 points. Um, and uh, this was no exception to it. It's not the prettiest looking cigar as far as the wrapper goes. It kind of looks like a lot of other cigars that Rocky makes. There's not, um, there wasn't some like specialty. It wasn't Rocky's favorite cigar at the trade show. Um, but for me, it was uh, one of the best ones and is right up there with the um, the San Andreas that was released a few years ago as far as Rocky Patels that I could smoke every day of the week and really enjoy it. Yeah, I agreed. I, uh, I was, I'm always intrigued to see like which one of Rocky's new releases is going to kind of rise to the top in a given calendar year because uh, it all seems like there's one or two that really just for some reason find a way to, to stand head and shoulders above the rest, and that was Tavacusa as well. And especially having been there... Uh, within the last year uh, during Piro Saborla in 2018. 18. God, I can't get the years right. Um, it was enjoyable to smoke a cigar that I had just, in a, from a place I had just been uh, and named for it in a celebratory cigar. Yeah, and Rocky certainly seems like he picks winners. I know when I talk to him every year at the trade show, he always tells me, oh, this is the one that's like, you have to smoke this, this is the best one. This was not it. It was the Hamlet Liberation was, I think, his favorite cigar at the trade show. Um, and... Uh, Maybe he was sleeping on Tavacusa a little bit. Who knows? I tell you this: uh, a lot of the, uh, well, not a lot, but uh, there are some people in the uh, smoking cigars that uh, don't give Rocky the credit that he deserves. I don't think if they smoke this one, I think they change their tune pretty quick. It's it's a really great cigar. Yeah, solid cigar. How's the Sudafet and alcohol mixing? Uh, wonderful. Great. Yeah, I'm I'm quite happy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Rafael Nadal says we need to switch to rum. You smell good, so. by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. 
Who is Hair in, smells great. Who's the in charge use? of uh, the HR department? Yeah. Is it what? Pantene? Or that's no. Like smell not, Pantene. Not, okay, you should lay off the beer, okay. but it's not Pantene. All right. All, right. All right. Number 13, and I believe the longest name of any cigar on the list this year, is the Saga Short Tails Tomo 6, the 6th Element L Tobacco. So this is part of De Los Reyes's or Saga Cigars book series, which are, uh, I think, formally called the Short Tail series. They all come in packaging that looks like books, um, looks like vintage books. They have uh, sort of a brown um, weathered texture on the front, and then the sides have green, uh, a green like uh, paper-like substance that's made to look like the binding of a book. They actually do contain some pages when you open them up. It was on our packaging awards two years ago, and, and rightfully so, and, and they continue to look fantastic. I can't wait for the series to be done, and we have all 10 of them, and we can line the books up and show them off altogether but this is the first time i think we've had a cigar uh, from the series that has been uh you know i mean it's, it's 13 out of 25 so it is a legitimate uh, uh force to be reckoned with as far as the cigar goes and it always seemed like with the first or from the first release they sort of set the tone um i was told about the series and about the concept and, and the first cigar that was part of the series was super strong and then the next one that came out was much much milder even more milder than what the factory is sort of known for and they've been sort of teetering back and forth between mild and strong and mild and strong and this isn't the goldilocks scenario this isn't the perfect balance between them amongst uh the first six but it is it's slightly towards the stronger side but it, it's it's the first one that i've had where the flavor seems like it's been the most important aspect of the cigar um and this also is another one on the list where uh you're getting a, a solid cigar at a good price um and some interesting packaging um and, and certainly would be one of the more valuable value picks uh amongst uh the top 25 this year or not yeah the the price was impressive when it comes down to what you're getting with it um it's 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 very um, it's a very, uh, they're very good smoke for the price that you're getting, basically, which is what I just said in another way. But yeah, and this there is, you go. For me, this is a series that I was really intrigued by uh, when it first came out because it was right around the August eighth deadline. Is that right? Uh, the Saga, the Short Tail series. Yeah. Uh, it just the, the release. I think they announced all of them. Yes. Yeah, the release hasn't seemed quite as linear. No, it's a, as. I maybe was expecting or, or well, no, because it set up. not only has it taken them a couple of years to get to six, but they also released, I think one, two, and then, or one, and then, yeah, one, two, and then three, four, five all came out at once. Right. Um, and then, and now we've gone sort of back to singular releases. They've been all different sizes, all different wrappers, all different blends, um, which is always the plan. But yes, it, it's not like, oh, every quarter we're going to release one. Right. Uh, but definitely... A series that I think has shined or shown a, a really nice light on the Saga brand, or Saga brand, which isn't as well known in the U.S., uh, but I have not been disappointed. I don't think by a single one in the in the series. And this, like you said, it wasn't the Goldilocks thing. It was just this one just seemed to kind of dial things in and up to the right to levels that yeah. I tend to enjoy. And it needs to be stated again, the packaging on these is fantastic. Indeed. Extremely, extremely unique. In fact, the uh, I, I didn't have the booth, but when I went by the booth, it's always like a library thing. Yeah. They have a, you know, they have a, that looks like a fake library where they have the books in there. They do. They have a lot of them. And what interesting thing, I just put the image back up so you can see it. If you look closely, um, and if you go to the review um, on the site, you can see this in much better detail. But the actual, the main band for this one is different than the first five. Um, they actually cut the letters out. So when you look at it, it's... Uh, the, in the saga, uh, the top band, you actually are seeing Cigar through um, the band, which was a nice small touch. I still don't really care for the main band, but that's uh, that's their sort of historical band. But um, the, the boxes are absolutely outrageous. And um, this one in particular, because it's dedicated to tobacco, there's a great picture of a leaf. And if you ever hear people talk about um, Viso Seco and Lijero and Primings and those sorts of things, there's a great picture inside the book, and it's in our review where you can see a tobacco plant, it shows here's where the Lara generally comes from, here's where the Viso generally comes from, et cetera. Um, so some educational aspects uh, for those people that actually read their cigar boxes, which is what my mother always told me to do. So from the probably the longest name on the list to the hardest to pronounce is our number 12 cigar, and depending on how you say it, it's the Poshanya SBC 18, a barber pole that uh, I really enjoyed this year. I had the chance to review it. Found it rich, complex, flavorful, well balanced. Uh, just a, a very enjoyable smoke uh, from start to finish. And one of the ones, as you get a little bit higher on the list, I can safely say that uh, as soon as I smoked one, I wanted another, or I was looking forward to the next one. 
just a really well done, well made cigar. It comes out of Fabrica de Tobacco's Nicosuania SA, which is the home of Roma Craft Cigars. And uh, construction was incredible and just gorgeous execution, great smoke, very enjoyable. Yeah, a worthy follow up to the SB16, SBC 16. Um, and uh, another cigar that was, uh, when it originally came out, was eligible for our packaging awards, made the packaging awards. And um, this year, I think the, the 18 is certainly better than the 16. Um, both were good cigars, but the 18 was, was really, really good. Yeah, 18 blows it away, in my opinion. I think in everyone's opinion. Hmm. Wait. Yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. So Perfect. I will stick around for number 11. And we spoke about uh, this factory a little bit earlier. It was the home of our number 25 cigar. And our number 11 cigar is the Blackworks Studio Killer B Connecticut. It looks like it might be a mild cigar, but it is anything but. Very flavorful, very uh, peppery, but well balanced, well constructed. Probably one of some of the best construction we have on the list this year. If I, judging from what the comments I read, uh, wonderful design shows off the artisanal work of uh, Fabrico Veja Negra, which is in Esteli, and just an incredible design, closed foot, uh, decorated cap, uh, and again. It, I hate to use the term kind of new, next generation of Connecticut's, but really showing what a Connecticut can do and can be other than just a plain, mild, introductory cigar. Yeah, uh, probably my least favorite term. Maybe that or vertically integrated. But um, it's just a wrapper. Just because it's lighter doesn't mean that you can put as much Lajero as you want underneath it. And um, uh, certainly uh, one of the, visually speaking, probably the most visually interesting cigar that we have on the list and also quite a bit of a change. It's a follow-up to the original Killer Bee, um, but this one had some some other touches that weren't on the original one. So you've got, if you look at the cap, I guess I'll probably throw that back on the screen for you guys. Um, you can see that it's got uh, like a nipple cap finish. Um, that was uh, a new feature. And then um, the foot is slightly different um, as compared to the original Killer Bee, uh, but still packed the strength that the name would imply. And, and they obviously have a whole list of sort of these uh, stinging creatures, which I know is Brooks's favorite thing. Um, as far as they've got Green Hornet and they've got Killer Bee, mm -hmm. uh, there's been some Yellow Jacket, no, maybe just the two of them. I feel like there was a third. Yeah, I don't know. Well, Brooks hates there's a Cato version in there. Yes, an offshoot. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Do you want an Arachnid series next, Brooks, or That'd is be it just awesome. the bees? No, it's just bees. I'm afraid of and ah. the horses. Ah, didn't know about the horses. Yeah, and all right. The uh, cotton that comes in pill bottles. We will not get into that. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, but we will get into the number 10 cigar of the year. Yes, number 10, hitting the cro the the, uh, the top 10. That would be the Bellis. Bellis? Bellis? I, I say Bellis. It's all right. Bellis Artis. Artis? Artis. Maduro. This is a, a follow-up to the original Bellis. Artis Maduro. Uh, uh, sorry, the original uh, blend that was released in 2016. Uh, A.J. Fernandez product. And uh, it has a, a combination of tobacco that is not seen very often in the cigar world. And I'm going to have to look this up because I don't so know exactly Brazilian what it is. Hold rapper. on, hold on. Brazilian Matafina wrapper with a Mexica Mexican San Andreas binder and fillers from Nicaragua. Uh, what I can tell you is that this made for a very interesting and unique combination. Um, extremely unique profile in my mind. Um, and uh, I was very impressed with the, uh, the different flavors that came out of it. Balance was not great uh, in my mind, but thank you. Sorry. Yes, it came too. Uh, balance was not as good as some of the other cigars on the top ten, but the flavors were, f were, were just awesome. Um, so, yeah, good, good job on that. For yeah, for AJ Fernandez and our factory of the year winner, um, and certainly a, a factory that's producing a ton of cigars, as we, or as Brooks noted in the post regarding why we chose AJ Fernandez's factory of the year this year. Uh, you know, it's not just the the uh, breadth of cigars they're producing, but it's also the quality of cigars um, that they are making. And I think oftentimes in the, in the world of AJ, and I know I've written about this before, um, I think the AJ brand has gotten lost sometimes in comparison to all the work that he does for Altadas in general and Southern Draw and Nicholas Melillo um, and Nomad and, and, and this person and that person. Um, but there's still some some really good cigars in, in the AJ line. And um, I know Bayes Artes, the original one, didn't necessarily score uh, as well uh, with us, but the, the Maduro version um, was absolutely fantastic. I agree. I It was funny. I was just given one of these by uh, 
uh, random dude you met in the corner. Yes, I was gonna say they're. I guess it's now former rep uh, for a region out here, and just hadn't kind of thought about it for a little bit and lit it up, smoked it, and just really was taken aback. A good Maduro, for me, does some pretty magical things for uh, for the palate, and I really enjoyed it. And again, like you say, it's kind of like the AJ brand itself gets overshadowed sometimes because of the the bigger name projects that he does. But he's certainly put out a number of great cigars for himself, and yeah. that's maybe one of the best. Bring back my Mbe. I think that's the truth. Uh, and this is obviously one of the best that he's put out this year uh, for himself, I think. I think it was one of the best cigars that came out of the factory this year. I mean, it's, it's, in, our, right. it's in our top ten. But, yeah, no, certainly uh, – Certainly, if you had to pick a cigar, or if I had to pick a cigar that's currently in the AJ portfolio, particularly now that uh, there's been some price changes and some of the the super affordable stuff is now just kind of affordable, I would definitely gravitate towards the base Artis Maduro, pay a little bit of a premium, but get a really bold, fantastic cigar. And um, you know, it sounds like Brooks had a few construction issues with it, but for me, the cigar was great. I tell you, the the the, the uniqueness was was high was high on my list, and that's what I you know I mean, I just. There's so many cigars out there that you smoke, and oh yeah, you got this, and you got this, and chocolate, and pepper, and whatever. This was extremely soy unique soy sauce, it's fried chicken skin. Um, but this was charred, ex- charred chicken skin. <sighs> whatever. Um, <laughs> this was extremely unique, and uh, I think people who were uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention: uh, most of the uniqueness, the flavors that I got were on the retro hail. Um, just about anything that I was picking up that was really uh, interesting was on the retro hail. If you're not retro hailing the cigar, you're wasting your money. So. On right, to number nine. Uh, number nine is the uh, n- the second Dunbarton release called Sin Compromiso Selection Numero Dos. Look at that. Wow. You like that? Thank you. Thank Who's you. butchering names now, Jack Thank Tarano? You. Thank you. Uh, probably still Brooks. Uh, still Brooks. But, yeah, but here's the thing. Now I forgot what about the cigar because I was concentrating on that. Every ounce of attention has been used up with the name. <laughs> I can remember uh, seeing this in uh, in our local store before it was even announced, almost. Although it may have been announced but not released. We saw this and picked it up, if you recall, Charlie. There's and, uh, uh, some of that humidor behind we were me. Told, uh, we were told it was nothing and that uh, it was just, a, you know, they were just sending these things out. We don't know if it's the same blend or not, but it was before because of the FDA stuff that happened. This is a, um, a release uh, that uh, uses, let me look at this again. Uh, San Andreas Negro wrapper, Ecuadorian Habano binder, and Nicaraguan fillers. Um, they are 13 count boxes. And uh, the interesting thing that I found about this was that the profile itself was just almost all chocolate. It is filled with chocolate, different types of chocolate, at least for me. Um, you know, dark chocolate and milk chocolate, and uh, you know, even a little bit of chocolate uh, from uh, from uh, candy bars, things like that. It was, it, it is a chocolate bomb. And uh, I was very impressed with it. I, 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 I think I liked the um, Mi Carita. 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 Nope, that was okay. further. All right, all right. Uh, a little bit better, but this was, um, this was, uh, this was absolutely, uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, I have not smoked any of the other sizes as of yet, so I'd like to do that as well. And, uh, but this one is well worth the, uh, well worth the uh, time and money that uh, it took to produce them for uh, Steve Saka. Yeah, a cigar that's been years in the making. I know that when um, we first found out that Steve Saka was coming back, you texted him or emailed him about Sin Compromiso because it was one of the trademarks, Mm -hmm. one of the original trademarks that he had filed for for his company, which didn't make any sense at the time, called Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. And um, he said it's in the works. Right. It took three years. And uh, I know that, um, you know, Saka certainly, I think, to his marketing chops is very – detrimental in terms of his outlook about how his own products are going to do um and i think that's part of the reason why he continues to gain and 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 retain the popularity he does i mean every time you hear him oh people shouldn't spend this much money i'm robbing people it's a waste you you know you can't believe people are going to spend this much and blah 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 blah. and we hear that every time we hear that with total solicitous now we hear it with sincompromiso certainly with unicorn western Osaka. um but this is a good cigar um it's not cheap. I mean, he's he's quite right that the cigars are, are not cheap, but um, it's a premium cigar, and uh, you, you you certainly get a premium cigar, and it's a top ten. And I'm sure that on Monday when I'm back here for the consensus, if history is any indication, I will be mentioning Sin Compromiso somewhere in the top 25. Yeah, I just remember writing up the review for this, and the word was, you know, finally, long awaited, long overdue, uh, eagerly anticipated, kind of all these words, because I still remember 
that initial conversation we had with Steve when he was uh, just right before he had announced the company. And I'm glad to say this is a cigar that was worth the wait. And especially when you name something Sin Compromiso without compromise, uh, to really see what that might mean for a guy like Steve Saka and how how he takes that to heart and executes that. So I was very impressed with Brooks nailed it. It's a chocolate, just a chocolate bomb. Um, I same thing. Brownies I'll throw in there as well. Uh, just a very well, it's not really chocolate. So I I didn't really know what. Huh? Um, Sudafed. Sudafed, everybody. <laughs> The top twenty-five. Uh, <laughs> One more thing, I, I at will least mention. numbers three, four, seven, nine, ten, fifteen, <laughs> eighteen, and twenty. <clears throat> One thing I will mention is I believe that uh, I bet money on the fact that Sin Compromiso is uh, in the top five of the consensus. It is just tearing That's, uh, up. It's a pretty solid bet. It is tearing up online. I mean, it is uh, you know everywhere. Everything it's I see online, the everything internet. not quite that impressive. Breaking but, the interwebs. Uh, it's uh, it's it's just tearing up online. It's doing really well um, in terms of people smoking it and enjoying it. Yeah, so we're getting closer to uh, number one. I should, yeah, I should say we should really snicker. Snicker, obviously, so, yes. Snicker Snickers and snicker and, and compromise. So. Snicker. Uh, don't forget we are on Facebook as well. If you want to jump in the comments in the chat group, uh, feel free to leave a question, leave a comment. Lots of good stuff going on. Do we on have there. any questions that we can answer, uh, uh, Patrick? Or I don't know. Is it just all comments about Charlie's hands? All right. Uh, why don't I? Yeah, most it, well and flavors. Uh, all right. Why don't I do number eight and then we'll put you look for some questions. There you go. And we'll see if we can come to a compromise. Um, a compromise. Compromiso. No. Oh, bad you, joke. Yeah. It's a good thing we didn't show that on camera. Very number awkward. Number eight is the Illusione Hot Ten Churchill. Uh, this is the second time that the Hot Ten has been on our top twenty-five list. This is the. Uh, worse of the two rankings because the other time it was on was 2016 and it got number one so the only way was was down from there i suppose but the odd 10 churchill is the follow-up to illusione's hot 10 which is i would sort of think is the flagship line of illusione it's certainly um the most expensive of the regular offerings and the original one obviously it was the number one cigar of the year had a big rating and uh we all loved it and the hot 10 churchill I, it divided the staff i think about which one is better um, I know the person on the left of me thinks that the original was better. I liked the Hot Den Churchill more, as I mentioned in my review. It's not a cheap cigar. Patrick purchased one uh, last night and uh, I think was in a bit of a sticker shock. Uh, but it is a very good cigar and uh, certainly worthy of being number eight on this list. Uh, and, you know, as Brooks mentioned earlier, Dion Gilito is very good at, at a very, you know, not a very specific profile, but he's... Certainly his best work has been done in a, in a very specific profile, which is um, sort of medium full-bodied cigars with full flavor or maybe a little bit less than medium full. And a lot of Nicaraguan tobaccos from Aganorsa, and the construction um, is just fantastic. He always goes for, um, he likes to describe it as a stack of dimes on the ash, um, a lot of uh, salvation in the mouth, uh, good smoke production, but not the sort of Ligabrata levels of craziness, um, and, and obviously flavor and balance being the, the two most important things. And so Hot 10 Churchill uh, is a, a worthy, worthy follow-up. Uh, the Gordo is also, or the Gordo size is also very good. It's a 6x60. We didn't review both of them because we, we sort of try to at least make our reviews a bit more diverse than that. Um, but either one of them probably would have made the top 25. It just happened to be the Churchill. And uh, it's always nice to see the Churchill Vitola on here. It doesn't get as much love these days as um, some of the other Vitolas, but it, it's a good classic size. Um, and finished off with a pigtail, which gets uh, bonus points from Brooks. Indeed, I do love the uh, the pigtails. Uh, I, you know, I get, I get asked quite often, you know, what is the one cigar company that you would smoke if you um, – well, not often because I don't talk to that many people. But, you know, when I do talk to people, what's the one cigar company that you would smoke if you were stuck on a desert island, yada, yada, yada? And I love, uh, I love Crown Heads, and I love Tatuaje, and I love a whole bunch of different people. But I tell you, if I had to smoke just one for the rest of my life, one company would be Illusione. I mean, they are wonderful. Uh, just about every cigar that I've had from his is great, and this is no exception. It's, it's excellent. Yeah, I agree. I, Charlie summed it up. I mean, I still am pretty loyal to the original Hot Ten. Uh, but I did smoke the Churchill last night, and it was very enjoyable. Uh, just doesn't quite wow me as much as the original, but, again, that's personal preference. you have any originals left? Original attends? Yes, yes, there are some here. And I have some at home, so. Mm. Like, original from that year, yes, there are some here. And they, they still make it. It's a regular production cigar. From that year, I mean. the first. Yeah, yeah, no, Indeed. we still have some. So a couple questions. Matthias wants to know, is the top 25 comprised of all 2018 releases or just the best of everything Half Wheel staff review during the year? It is the latter. Uh, so basically, we take about the top 10% of the cigars that we review uh, in the course of a year. They have to have come out generally within the last, within the calendar year, although that's changed a little bit. 
in the post August 2016 world, uh, we've had to adjust a few things. So, and again, it's unfortunate for some, you know, in the case of where cigars are coming out later in the year, uh, they just run up against a time window if we were to do a hard deadline uh, of whatever date it may be. So you will see some stuff that was a 2017 release on the 2018 list because we do think it's worth reviewing it so it just gets moved over to the next list. Uh, so that was, I hope that answers that question, gives you a little more insight. Uh, I think this year we reviewed about, do you know what the number was? It was uh, like 280 cigars, although that number doesn't count how many cigars were actually eligible for the list. I don't right. know what the, the total number of those were, because that includes reuxes and other things. Sure. So 200-ish, in yeah. the low 200s as far yeah. as reviews. And we take about the top, I guess it will be about 15%. Um, so the, the threshold is the top, uh, whatever it would be for the top 10%, which always sort of falls into be um, 91. Right. Um, because they're, they're, it's not an even bell curve when right. it comes to skewing scores. And we also have things, um, so like the um, that Mundo Dantes that was on uh, earlier, that was a cigar that was reviewed in 2017, and by the time that we got more cigars back in the office to have enough for the entire collective staff to smoke, it was past our 2017 top 25, so it just got pushed back to 2018. We've gotten a little bit more lenient with those rules, and there's some other stuff. It's tough because, like, um, with the Illusione, the Le Grand Classe Rex, that was a cigar that came out with a whole bunch of other Illusiones, including Hot 10. Sure. And uh, it wasn't like we were going to have two weeks of Illusione reviews on the website. So right. we spread them out over the course of the years, but didn't feel like it was worth punishing um, Illusione for releasing a whole bunch of cigars at one time. Right. And then on, I believe on wants to say, uh, or ask, any trends you're seeing in price points and ranking? Um. Not really. I think the average price point's probably lower than last year, if I had to guess. Really? Yeah. Um, I think we can talk about that a little bit uh, after the number one stuff comes out. But yeah, I mean, there's not um, not as many 15 16 17 18 20 dollar cigars in the, the top 25 this year. There you go. So, we move on to number seven. And number seven is mine, the one I'm talking about, would be the uh, Tatuaje the Bride. The, uh, the final release in this specific series of uh, Tatuaje, of Pete Johnson's Tatuaje Monster Series. Started in 2008 with the Frank and uh, has moved on since then. There were two, uh, if you're counting, the, the, the numbers don't add up. There were two of them uh, that were uh, added <clears throat> a little bit after they were released and uh, made into official monsters. Uh, Chucky and Tiff. the Bride of Chucky, Tiff, yeah. And so uh, the... Um, this cigar specifically is uh, is a uh, uh, Connecticut Broadleaf wrapper, which is the only the second time in the series that Connecticut Broadleaf was was uh, used. JV thirteen was the uh, was the other one. Um, came in uh, six hundred sixty six dress boxes with the bride we showed off last uh, yesterday with the uh, packaging awards, and um, as well as the uh, the normal boxes, ten count boxes as well. I forget how many. Charlie, do you know right off the top of your head how many ten count boxes? Yes. No, the number's changed. It's in the review. Uh -huh. In the review. So, uh, where, however many there was. Uh, but 666 dress boxes plus a few the extra that uh, for, uh, for uh, charity. Pete and Charity. Um, I, uh, you know, I've never thought that the, um, I've never thought that the Monster Series were the most amazing um, of Pete's creations. Um, I've never thought that it was uh, that they have been just the the most uh, stellar every year. This one was actually one of the best monster series that I smoked. Um, it was uh, it was extremely balanced, very flavorful, and uh, the construction was excellent. So, yeah, I know that that when I first met you, and we were only a few monsters in at that point, that you had always mentioned the monster series were sort of, uh, especially for the price at the time, when thirteen dollars was a, a pretty big premium for. Uh, Taiwan cigar where n now it's kind of evened itself out into the middle of the portfolio um you always thought that that the monsters didn't represent pete's best work but what's interesting this is the second year in a row we've had a monster in the top 10 mm -hmm. um, and i think the latter six monsters have been better than the original six or five i guess if we want to get specific um and uh but two in the last or two the second year in a row in the top 10 um, and I think there's been two other ones in the top 25 as well. So it's not to say that the ones have been terrible. And it's Certainly also not. Worth, it's also worth pointing out the monsters have also sometimes been like a black label in a big size. So it's not just a – it's not always unique blends, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. I will say this. The Frank, when I smoked the Frank back in 2008, uh, the Frank was one of the best cigars I'd smoked at that time. 
Uh, granted, you know, the, the uh, Connecticut Broadleaf was, you know, the, the way he was using Connecticut Broadleaf was not uh, done as much back then. It was a fairly new, you know, fairly new situation in terms of what he was doing with that. But it was fantastic, and, and uh, it, was, it was very, very good. Don't smoke them now. They, they are not very good. But, uh, Patrick? I think you guys pretty much have covered it. You know, like I said, I, I always look forward to a monster release. I try and go into it with uh, a clean palate and, and just see what is going to be delivered by the cigar. And, again, I was pleasantly surprised by this. I was a little surprised it got as high as it did on the list just from what I thought about it because I tend to think we sort of know each other's profiles and where uh, stuff might rank. And, again, there's ones that catch me off guard every year. And uh, I think the, the, the Monster Series as a whole tends to – not be a divisive series because that's not the right word but like you say people either don't think it's it's pete's best work or they do tend to like him and tend to hold him in pretty high regard so uh yeah well pete's mentioned correct charlie that uh he's gonna continue doing this in some way um yeah do, the you, gravy train has not officially do, left do we station. know do we do we have we're any not, uh, any thoughts cool. on on how, what that's going to be the actress series perhaps come back uh i do not know but i would imagine the actor series is probably done hmm if I had to take a guess, that oh. and the meat locker, probably two oh. things that aren't. Oh, uh, that meat locker. <laughs> aren't coming back. Uh, oh, I wish we'd released the meat locker. There you All go. right. Moving on to number six. It is football season, and uh, the playoffs are Why here. Eagles. <clears throat> and I'm sure this will start to uh, wake up the chat room a little bit, but our number six cigar of 2018 is the La Flor Dominicana Special Football Edition 2018. This has been a series that's been out for four years now. Uh, where La Florida Minicana creates a limited edition cigar that is only sold in the state where the Super Bowl is being played and uh, comes decorated with a football, borrowing some of the artistic side that we've seen uh, La Florida Minicana use on, on the Salomones, uh, the Unico edition. And uh, while I have I go back and forth on whether or not cigars like this are, are going to be great or if they're just something to create a little buzz, this one really stood out head and shoulders uh both from sort of the regular the floor profile and the previous three cigars that were on that list uh that were in the series while the florida's a lot of strength a lot of harrow this one didn't show that as much it was a lot more balanced a lot more uh widespread as far as its flavors definitely enjoyed it and made for a really uh, enjoyable fun cigar to smoke yeah, I was really impressed with the lack of strength in this in this blend and the balance that came about because of that. Um, you know, it, it was so strong. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't it wasn't overwhelming by any means, and it really allowed a lot of the other flavors in the blend to shine through. Um, I, I uh, when I first heard about this in the, in the you know in the first uh, release, I thought it was a gimmick and nothing more. And I, while I wasn't as impressed with the first release as I was with this one, I I love this one quite a bit. Um, it's very very you know very good cigar. Uh, yeah, I, I could care less about the cigar. Although I did review it because um, the Eagles won the Super Bowl. You and, care less uh, about the cigar? Yeah, I could care less about this cigar. The Eagles won the Super Bowl. doesn't matter how good or bad the cigar is. Huh. So Matthias has a quick question on that. Yeah. Uh, in our opinion, did the tobacco artwork on the cigar affect the taste in any way? No, or but missing field goals does. <coughs> um, wow, spicy. So you're saying it was spicy? Uh, no, the tobacco does have an effect on it. Um, but I would say on this one in particular, it's not as noticeable. Um they're, I think the second one in the series is the, the only one that I can really tell you like it was a noticeable change, but it's not enough of the wrapper. And you've also got, um, there's just so much going on because you've right. got the foot has got some of that tobacco on it. Um, you've had one cigar where you've had an angled foot. And then as you can see, or as you could see when it was up on the screen, um, the, the cap also has some of that tobacco on it. And yeah, I mean, it's certainly. I'm sure if you if you smoke them side by side, one with the the football on it and one without the football on it, you would, you would have a much better shot of knowing it. But it it's tough to make that call when you're you're just smoking this one cigar. Right. Yeah, I didn't notice any major difference. And I mean, when you're, I mean, it's it's not. It's just it wasn't. It's something you'd point to and go, "Wow, that's amazing." You know. Well, not. and then you're trying to figure out if is is it just that one particular piece of tobacco, or is there something else going on the filler or whatever. Yeah, I think if you could do it side by side, that may be the best way. But even that, you're still going to have some variance from cigar to cigar. So on that note, uh, baseball season is coming up. Yeah, and the Eagles are still in the playoffs somehow, which is crazy. And what the Cowboys are, too. What is it with you and the Eagles? Eagles fan. I, know, I can't talk about the Flyers. 
Although we did Ugh. beat the Stars the other night, but and I can't talk about who the hasn't songs, beat the Stars. You know. This is true. Um, although we have a winning record against the Mavericks. Moving on, number five. Number five, the Davidoff. Uh, we should point out that there uh, is actually no number five. Uh, yes, sorry. There are two number fours. That's it, it, right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it is a tie for number four. Correct. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Davidoff, uh, Dia de Venus. 50. Year. <laughs> uh, now, this is, uh, as, the, uh, as the name indicates, this is the, uh, a uh, commemorative cigar release for the 50th anniversary of the Davidoff blend. Davidoff line, excuse me, brand. And... <clears throat> Excuse me. <Sudafed>. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it is a, uh, the same size as a release uh, that was uh, released back in 2006. Is that correct, Charlie? Uh, it's the same um, cigar, yeah, or the same I size. Talk- I was talking about the year. Oh, the date? Yeah, 2006, 2006 is right. yeah. Now, that one was unbanded. Uh, it's become a legendary cigar. It came in boxes, uh, very, you know, very simple, very, uh, very uh, wood boxes. <laughs> Um, but uh, these are in uh, amazing uh, uh, jars. The new ones are in amazing jars that we talked about yesterday for packaging awards. Uh, it is it is wonderful in every way. Davidoff it really outdid itself with this uh, with this release. Um, uh, again, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the size in terms of the uh, the, the, the the length of the uh, the cigar. This one I didn't want it to end. It was it was wonderful in uh, in every way. Very expensive, thirty three dollars, uh, thirty six dollars actually I think MSRP. Um, and uh, the jars were, uh, but uh, you know, very, very um, difficult to find sometimes for some people. And these are, but uh, if you can find some, they're wonderful. Yeah, it's a, it's a great cigar. Um, it's potentially, I think, it has the potential to age very similar to the regular D M S Venus. Um, this is a cigar that's got a lot of that allure profile that is uh, probably not everyone's favorite profile from Davidoff. Um, it's that mushroomy mustiness. Um, it's surrounded by a lot of strength and a lot of stronger tobacco. So it's maybe not as pungent as with some of the milder Davidoffs, but it certainly has the allure. And that was something that I noticed as smoking DMS Phoenix as they've aged, um, the original ones, um, the allure sort of falls off a little bit and it allows some of these other flavors to shine through. So maybe there's a chance, but, um, to try to, I smoked, um, at the beginning of the year or the beginning of 2018, I'd smoked, um, a DMS Phoenix, um, from the original batch and then obviously smoked, uh, these for the review and, and it's tough to compare the two. Um, they certainly don't look the same either, but that also, you know, there's variances in the tobacco. Um, but I think there's the opportunity. And, and nonetheless, uh, the, the current DMS Venus is also a very good cigar. Yeah, the only thing I would ever tack on is that it's a challenge when you release cigars like this because you are always going to be held to the standard of the original. And you had said in your predictions for 2018, if I'm not mistaken, that if, they, if Davidoff can get one of these three cigars they were trying to release right, it would be a great year. Yeah, and between that, the Ava 22, and the LEO 5. Correct. And I certainly think... Again, I'm never going to sit here and say it's the exact same cigar. It, it, it pegs it spot on, but it was really, really close and did a great job uh, with the release and, and, and a cigar I enjoyed for a format that is not necessarily the, the most convenient to smoke in terms of time and, and other things. You know, the interesting thing was that I am and I have always not been a fan of that Allure tobacco that you mentioned, the mushroom flavor in it. Um, and there was some in this cigar, there's no doubt about it, but I did not notice... Uh, an overwhelming amount by any means, and uh, for me at least, it was it was it was certainly uh, not uh, prevalent enough for me to uh, to to knock points off, uh, obviously. Um, but uh, it was, you know, I mean, I think that, that maybe it was more balanced. Maybe it just had less of it that that maybe I noticed. But uh, it was there, but it wasn't prevalent at all. All right, moving on to the other number four, um, and that would be the Cornelius and Anthony the Gent Gordo. I feel safe in saying that if there was one cigar that is on this list that uh, is the most surprising of the bunch, particularly in where it finished, uh, it would be this. Cornelius and Anthony had made some good cigars prior to the Gent, but much like with the discussion I was having with Rocky Patel or, or about the Rocky Patel, the Tabacusa, the Gent was, and Patrick, I think you can confirm this as you cover their booth, it was the secondary of the two new cigars they had at the show. They wanted to talk about the Mistress, which is the other cigar, and then there was also the Gent, and as it turns out, um, I think that it's safe to say that the Gent is far and away the better of the two cigars, at least as far as the four of us are concerned. Um, not as strong as a, as a cigar, but um, certainly when it came to uh, balance and complexity, um, this was, was all about that. It was a cigar that 
um, flavor wise didn't really remind me of the original Los Calaveras, but when I was smoking it and reviewing it, it was somewhat similar to it. It seemed like a coming out party. I always thought the Los Calaveras for Crown Heads was uh, a sort of a new chapter that they had entered in terms of of the blend that they had put out previously. And then there was the original Los Calaveras and it was like, okay, wait a minute, they can really uh, take it to a different level. And the Cornelius and Anthony the Gent, particularly given that it's a six by 60 size, which would preferably not be what I would smoke on a daily basis. Um, I thought this was a cigar that, that showed a whole new side to not only Cornelius and Anthony, but also to Lazona, who's made some good cigars before, but maybe not as layered um, medium full profiles as this one. It, it Normally I would find Lazona to be either medium with a lot of complexity or um, having fuller cigars where one note um, is really the, the leading uh, character and then there's some other things going on beneath it. Uh, but this was a, a solid medium full with uh, just a ton of complexity. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And for those wondering, yes, two number fours. Uh, we did have a tie for fourth place, so that's why you're seeing that. But I agree with you. I mean, I definitely remember the billing of the mistress as being, I mean, this is going to be the cigar. It's, just, it's stronger, and, and it certainly was. Um, and I think that's one thing for me that I've noticed just speaking about my own palate, I'm much more appreciative of more complex medium body cigars where you really get to kind of go dive into them as opposed to just having everything thrown right on your tongue. And, uh, you know, it, it's pepper and strength and bold and, and whatnot. And that's what the gent did for me. And, and again, the, the blend to a 6x60 six was brilliantly executed. And like you said, I think it was a, it was a marked step forward for everyone involved with the project. Yeah, very surprising for me, not because I didn't think that they could do anything like this, but just because uh, the way that they were talking, the mistress was going to be the one that was going to blow everybody away. Um, and so I went into this with a little bit, hey, you know, mistress is the one that's supposed to be great. Um, the 6x60 obviously did not uh, help my uh, predictions any, but in terms of the flavor and the profile, um, it was really, really good. The The retrohale on this is insane. It is absolutely just, I mean, it, there's just so much going on. Um, that uh, you really have to sit back and relax. And it, I actually like the fact that it's this is uh, yeah. 6 by 60 because it gives you more time to actually be able to pinpoint some of those flavors on the retro hail that you wouldn't normally have. And uh, it, it's really, really wonderful, and uh, they should be proud of it, uh, of, of what they've done. Indeed. Well, we've outraged Skip Martin by having a tie on the list. So, sorry, Skip, but thanks for watching. All right. All right. The uh, number three is the Romeo e Giulietta. Grand Reserva Cosecha, 2009. Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, now, this was actually released in 2015. It is a, uh, it is a uh, uh, somewhat of an um, ongoing um, con Issue? discussion about uh, whether the uh, cigar is given out at the Festival del Habano um, every year uh, at, the, uh, at the actual event um, are the ones that are shipped they are um, not. <laughs> do you know how I know this, Brooks? <clears throat> how do you know this, Charlie? Because uh, that cigar was released uh, at the festival. It was showing off three years prior before it shipped. Mm -hmm. And those Cuavas are going on five years. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to bet that they, uh, they're they not just waiting on packaging for five years. What about Fuente? They, haven't they waited on packaging for five years? Yeah, but they haven't shown off cigars and then waited five years to release them. Uh, this was uh, fantastic. It was uh, It was wonderful. It was awesome. Um, and uh, and uh, it's one of the better Cubans that I've smoked in the past couple of years, especially, quote, newer Cubans. Um, and uh, while I did not smoke any of the original uh, from the two-pack, um, I would be hard-pressed to think that it could they could be much better than that. I bet they were. <laughs> hmm? um, yeah, no, it's uh, the Grand Reserve and Reserva series tend to always be fantastic. I, I think Cabanos at least understands if, if they have one thing that they understand, it's that uh, besides that they can make any Cohiba and they can sell it for any price. It's that the Grand Reservas and the Reservas should get their best tobacco. Uh, they should be the Halo releases that they are. And, and generally speaking, they, they've been very good. They're not cheap. Um, this is, a, a at a minimum, a $60, $65 cigar. And, and if you're in Canada, it's, it's over $100 a cigar uh, from a retailer at the suggested retail price. Um, and certainly on the secondary market, if we've learned anything, Grand Reservas and Reservas are going to go up as time goes on. But... Um, when they do actually come out and when you do have the opportunity to buy them, uh, they tend to be very good cigars and they avoid a lot of the problems that the typical Cubans have or, or that are typically the complaints about Cubans, which are that they're plugged and they don't burn right and, and they're young and those sorts of things. Um, they tend to fix those issues, but you pay a, a heavy price for them. Indeed. I still remember smoking the cigar uh, when we first got 
the uh, the samples from the festival. You were the only one that smoked them mm. from the festival. This is true. Well, we've all, I think we've all probably had that experience since in covering it. Probably. Probably. But I was never a big Romeo and Julieta fan. Uh, just to be totally honest with you, there were some of the Churchills I liked. But on the whole, it was not a brand that, that I would ever reach for or keep in my humidor or generally even really had good things to say about it. But I remember smoking this one, and it was transcendent in a way. Uh, well-balanced, well-processed tobacco. Just everything seemed to be right about it uh, other than price and availability. So, like I said, when you know when Cuba wants to make a, a good cigar, they can do it. And it's unfortunate that it has to come with such limited availability and such a high price tag, but it doesn't s- negate the fact that they are still very, 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 very good cigars and, and worthy of that Grand Reserve tag. So we are down to our final two. Lots of questions going on in the uh, in the. Anybody has anybody uh, uh, selected the number one cigar yet? No, <laughs> I have not seen it. All right. Well, why don't we get to those uh, final two cigars and then we'll deal with some questions and wrap this up. Otherwise, and just remember, Jamie says stop playing drums. Tony Morales might uh, actually win um, his bet about the over. Anyway, so uh, the number two cigar of the year, and I will point out that uh, this was the closest that we've had. It was uh, less than a tenth of a point separating the number one and number two once we averaged, averaged the scores out, uh, is the Le Carême Bellicosis Finos 2018 LE from Crown Heads. It is made at Ernesto Perez Carrillo Jr.'s Tabacalera La Alianza Seada in the Dominican Republic. It is a follow-up to the 2016 Le Carême line, um, and it's the first follow-up. It's, a, as the name implies, a limited edition release. Oh, sorry. Well played, Brooks. And uh, it was fantastic. Uh, it's probably my personal favorite cigar of, of 2018 amongst the ones that actually came out in 2018. And uh, obviously, to get number two, it, it would seem to be the case that it was well-liked by the rest of the staff as well. I thought this cigar tasted uh, like uh, uh, it had a lot of similar notes to fresh Opus X, which are sort of a controversial topic within themselves, um, but a profile that I actually enjoy quite a bit. It was um, medium full to full with a lot of uh, solid uh, notes, and really uh, the cigar pushed um, your palate or pushed my palate. You didn't have to work to find the flavors, um, and, and they were sort of right in your face, but in a, a manner that was approachable and, and one that was heavily enjoyable. And the best compliment that I can personally give a cigar, um, given what we do for a living, which is that we smoke cigars, and every week we have two or three new cigars that we have to smoke. We have to smoke three of them, and it's a never-ending cycle that takes place um, 365 days a year. So I don't smoke a lot of cigars personally, and I, I certainly don't repeat smoking a lot of cigars personally. Um, and if I can take a cigar that came out this year and I end up buying that cigar personally for myself, it happens with, with usually, you know, at least in a box quantity, usually it's one or two boxes a year I buy for myself to sort of smoke personally. This was that one for 2018, and um, it turns out the rest of the staff was, I think, in, in relative agreement with me. Yeah, I I just loved everything that this cigar had to offer. And, and you, you touched on flavors being upfront but not overwhelming, and the analogy that I tend to use a lot is if you ever go to a symphony, um, you know, it's, it's Brooks doesn't plenty loud, but it's not <coughs> overwhelming. It's, it's balanced. You can hear detail, uh, yet you can hear the complexity of all the instruments playing together when they do that. That was this cigar. I mean, it was just an incredible blend of, uh, of, of strength, of flavor, of nuance without necessarily overwhelming anything and just a, a brilliantly blended cigar yeah yes i agree 100 percent. everything you guys said just so, like i cats. mean i think i think it's wonderful uh if if it was a symphony it would be cats that's right exactly yeah. correct although it was actually more of a musical than a symphony but we're definitely not a symphony um it uh it, the idea is that uh, it, it it's blended wonderfully and um, there is absolutely nothing that I could, f- almost nothing that I could find wrong with it. I think there was one time that I, you know, had to touch it up once or whatever. But it was, it was, there was, it, it was, it was one of the best cigars that I smoked all year, obviously. And it was, uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yes, that's enough of that. And so with that, we come to the number one cigar for the Half Wheel yeah, staff nice. of 2018, and. I am proud to say that it actually has been guessed in the comments on Facebook. Wow! So I don't know. Well, if we eventually you were going to get good there. Good guess on somebody, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it you're... took us announcing the first twenty-two cigars, and then you eventually could right. boil it down. To, yeah, yeah. And this cigar, I know, is not going to make a lot of people happy because of how limited and hard to find it is. 
but it was a cigar that was absolutely magnificent. It actually has number one in its name, call it maybe an indicator of how it was going to finish. The number one cigar of 2018 for the Half Wheel staff was the Hoya de Nicaragua number one. Uh, it is a limited edition event only cigar that was used at uh, Drew Diplomat retailer uh, events over the summer. It was a add on for purchases. Uh, there's no price to it. There, we don't really know how many are out there. Uh, but what I can tell you is that when it was made available and I got to smoke it, uh, it was cl clearly to me going to be one of the top cigars of the year, if not the number one. Uh, where you may think of Hoya for Lajero and power and strength and, and really full-bodied cigars, this showed almost everything except that. It showed how they can work in nuance, how they can work in balance, how they can work in subtleties and complexities and flavor transitions and really deliver an absolutely outstanding cigar. Uh, this is a cigar that is based on the same cigar that is in the classic, or it's based on the classical line, at least on paper. That's the uh, sort of the explanation. It's also the same size that is used for ambassadors of the country to uh, use in their work uh, as gifts and and other uh, whatever activities. Activities you want to call it, but an absolutely outstanding cigar. Looks a little bit different based on the color, the band based on the colors of the Nicaraguan flag. And just a remarkable, remarkable cigar that the entire Hoya de Nicaragua staff should be incredibly proud of. And please send me more. Yeah, this the, when I was smoking this cigar, the first thing that I thought of when I finished it was Harmony. This cigar has everything in Harmony. Everything is absolutely the way that it should be. Uh, the flavors are there. The uh, strength is there. The uh, the the, the uh, balance is there. Uh, everything. Is, the the construction was wonderful. Everything is uh, is absolutely um, as close to perfect as I've gotten in a cigar in a very long time. Um, I would buy as many as I absolutely could if I could. And uh, I don't buy. Price. I don't buy any cigar. I don't buy many cigars. So well, you, um, you do just not for yourself. Well, okay. I don't buy many cigars out of my own pocket. Um, and uh, I would buy as many as I could, 100%. Uh, it, is, it is easily the top cigar that I smoked this year, last year. This year or last year? Whatever. No, the, the Hoya de Nicaragua number one is a great cigar. Send more. Uh, it's a, um, I, I think Patrick spoke long enough to describe it, but yes, it's a fantastic cigar. It is certainly worthy of our number one in a year where Hoya is celebrating their 50th anniversary. Um, it sort of got lost in the shuffle. They never really formally announced the cigar. Um, it was at events. It was supposed to only be at events for about a quarter, and I think it stuck around for maybe a little bit longer, but not um, in, a, in a year where they were very public about celebrating the 50th anniversary with um, Cinco de Cadiz. Uh, this was not the one that got talked about um, really at all, other, other than our website and, I guess, the Drew Estate event page. Um, but a fantastic cigar nonetheless, and it caps off a great year. I think we're going to get through um, some brief... Uh, other sort of details about the top 25 and then we'll get to whatever last questions and wrap this up so um, if you are wondering about kind of how things went in terms of performance by country and if you weren't keeping track uh, on your scorecard at home uh, you will find that Nicaragua absolutely killed it this year as far as uh, dominating our top 25 list um, as you can see uh, Cuba and the Dominican Republic had a combined seven and Nicaragua had the remaining 18 um, I think as much of the discussion should be about Nicaragua and, and sort of certainly the country going through some issues unrelated to cigars, but the performance of cigars coming out of Nicaragua continues to be stellar. This is um, the most dominant year we've seen any country have on the top 25 since we've been doing it at half wheel. Um, but it also leads to like my first obvious question, which is what's going on in Honduras um, and why are Honduras and, and, you know, I guess to some extent the U.S. not represented at all. There was at least one Honduras cigar uh, or Honduran cigar that was considered for the top 25. It didn't, didn't make it on the list, but um, if you want to know about trends, I think that it's not that we're not reviewing cigars from Honduras, and it's not that we're not reviewing cigars from the U.S. and other countries. It's just, uh, for whatever reason, this year was was a year where Nicaragua seemed to be putting out the best of the best. 
and I'm being told we need to wrap this up. So uh, for those keeping track at home, you will know that there are uh, four companies who managed to get uh, two entries on the list. Um, and those four countries are, or four companies are the following, um, Drew State, Dumbarton Tobacco Trust, Habanos S.A. Auto, which should have a second period on it, and Illusione. And um, yeah, interesting uh, list. Uh, there are certainly, um, Illusione has historically done extremely well on this list. Drew State's had some years where they've done very well and then had some years where they haven't done as well. Um, maybe not as strong of a showing from Davidoff and Taiwahe as we've come to expect, but um, nonetheless, uh, a very good year for uh, not just those four companies, but um, some other ones. And there are, as far as factories are concerned, if you're wondering about um, the factories that managed to place two on this list, um, here are the five factories that were able to do that. None of them managed to get three, but uh, the following five got two. AJ Fernandez, La Grand Fabrica, Drew State, Fabrica, Oveja Negra, Hoy de Nicaragua, and Tobacco uh, Tapsa, which is the Aganorsa owned factory in Esteli. Of note, all five of those factories are all in Esteli. So um, certainly the, the Nicaraguan influence uh, going on there as well. And it's nice to see um, we've got um, Oveja Negra on here um, for really, the, you know, it's not the first time they've been on the list, but, you know, have two on the list um, is pretty impressive and uh, I think highlights um, the very uh, productive year that they've had in 2018. Patrick is making notes. So, any last questions before we? Well, yeah, I think there's a, there's a number that have come up in the uh, in the chat, which I'm going to get back to. Obviously, can I have that one? Yeah, Thanks, Mark. you're welcome. Let me know how it pairs with Sudafed. Yeah, uh, I think the most common question <laughs> that I've seen so far, <laughs> and uh, ab about this is when is it going to end? <clears throat> yes, number two. Why like an event only cigar? Uh, reviewed, let alone get number one. Yeah, why do we keep giving Cigar of the Year to cigars that people don't sell? Um, look, I, I know when Brooks and I were starting this website back in 2011, and for those of you that are unfamiliar with the story, we merged. Brooks had a website called Smoking Stogie. I had a website called The Cigar Feed. Uh, so we were both blogging about cigars beforehand, and we merged the site, and Patrick uh, joined forces just before we launched. And um, we had a lot of conversations about kind of what we wanted to do in terms of reviewing cigars and, and news and things like that. And, and I was always a, I always was frustrated with top 25 lists and top 10 lists because there seems like there was always all the, there was this a sanitation of the, the list. And, and, and what you ended up with was lists that weren't really representative of what people thought was the top 10 cigars. It was like, oh, these are the top 10 cigars, but only if I allow Padron to only have one cigar on the top 10. Um, and it's like, no, if Padron put four out of the top 10 cigars on the list, you should put four. Padron should get four out of the top ten. We've had years where Taiwan has had five of the top twenty-five, and that's just an indication of of how good of a year Taiwan had. And so, um, in the same regard, people were like, "I don't put limited edition cigars. I don't put Cuban cigars. I don't put cigars that you can't buy. I don't put retail exclusive cigars." And it was like, "Well, you shouldn't. You should open it up. If you're going to do a best of list, as far as I'm concerned, you should put the best of it. There's no difference in that Hoya de Nicaragua number one that Brooks just took off this table, and uh, you know the Hoya de Nicaragua." Uh, silver. There, it's the same. It's a cigar. It's 100% tobacco. It's got a band on it, and even if it didn't, it'd be the same thing. The only difference is one is sold and one's not, and that has no difference about how it scores on our site, and has no difference about how a consumer at home would enjoy the cigar. So um, I understand that it's frustrating. Last year we had a cigar that was a retail-only exclusive cigar make number one. Although you could buy it. You could buy it, but you had to go to a specific retailer, and it wasn't uh, you know, certainly Fine Ash Cigars in Arizona is, is a noted retailer, but it's not Cigars International. It's not one that I think the vast majority of cigar consumers um, will ever run into. But um, we want to put the best cigars that we smoke on there. And it would be, I think, an even bigger travesty and a harder explanation to be like, oh, this is the, you know, if we said the Le Carême is the number one cigar of the year, but oh, by the way, we actually liked this Hoy de Nicaragua better. But the Le Carême is the number one cigar of the year. So we are... You know, whatever we review, as long as we review it, and as long as it's you know relatively recent, it's right. eligible. No, absolutely. And like I say, you know, whenever people want to engage me in conversations about top twenty-five lists, I say, look, you always have to consider your universe of what's out there. Um, every publication, magazine, website is going to have to put some kind of limit or some kind of constraint on their list, whether that be availability or, like Charlie said, if they're you know, some people won't review Cubans, uh, some people won't review. Uh, some people will review stuff that's been out on the market for three, four, five, ten years because they want to go back and revisit it and see what the current crop of a certain cigar is. You know, we have our universe, and that does include things like event-only and store exclusives, like you saw in the Herrera Esteli 
uh, Ink to Me Exception. Uh, we had two in the top three last year with the Fine Ash Corona Gorda from uh, Casada, and then the uh, Davidoff Ambassador AFC 20th. Two Arizona stores, which not to plug my own neighborhood, but I was really proud for them to do. It's a so big well. neighborhood. It is, uh, but you know, and, and that's the thing. Everyone has their own universe. What I will say though, um, and actually Juan Martinez has just jumped in the room, so hello Juan, thanks for uh, checking us out. Uh, the Hoyo uh, number one, the Ambassador blend, is on paper the same as the Classical blend. I'm not going to speculate if it gets any tweaks or if there's any little manipulations that are done to it, but that is a 6x44, and the regular classical blend has a 6x41 called the Numero 6. So if you can't get that particular cigar, I would highly suggest go out, get the Hoya Classica uh, Numero 6. It's three ring gauges off. Yeah, Classica is a good line anyway, yeah, and mean, people is, should be smoking more of them. Well, and that's the thing is that, like, this is the first cigar that was recognized as the official cigar of Nicaragua. I mean, it is a historic classic line that has laid incredible amounts of groundwork for the company and foundation and is still, I think, one of the most underappreciated cigars maybe in their entire portfolio. So, again, it, yes, that's an event-only cigar. Yes, the band's a little bit different. But it's not like you can't go out and find a very close comparison to it in the classical line. And listen, one one thing I agree with everything that y'all said, obviously. But I also I also have one thing to add, which is if you want to see more of this cigar, then email them and tell them this. I can remember a cigar, a little little cigar called the uh, Casada España, which uh, we uh, we rated quite highly. It was only available in Spain at the time when we, we when we reviewed it. Eventually, they came out with this thing in multiple vitolas that anybody could buy. Because people were clamoring. Partly, Thank you, partly, Christian Hudson. Partly because people were clamoring to see it, to smoke Thank it. Thank you, and to Christian Hudson. <laughs> so if you want this cigar. Or you if know, your name is Christian Hudson. <clears throat> email uh, email somebody at, uh, at uh, well, I wouldn't say you know email Juan. He probably doesn't uh, doesn't want a million emails. But uh, email somebody Reach at. Reach out uh, to him on social media. Hoya did Nicaragua and ask for it. And maybe they'll, uh, maybe they'll make them. Um, that would be a wonderful thing for us because I'd smoke the hell out of them. And on that note, um, I think we are going to wrap up what has been a much... We have more, more questions? I ha- actually one, there, there is one I would like to ask. Okay. Uh, I really have to get back to work. I know. We all do. It's, <laughs> it's a one-time-of-year thing. Uh, just real quick. Except any, for yesterday and on Monday. Any hints for cigars that missed the 2018 cutoff list that we could see on the 2019 list? The only one that's actually on there is the Cuaba 20th. Um, in terms of stuff that's been rated that is eligible... It'll, I don't, be one, it'll be one you can't find. There is 60-some-odd cigars that we've purchased that are haven't been scheduled for review yet, so um, I, I don't have time to run through all of them right. and, and can't make any guesses. And, and I don't think, it, you know, I mean, I think the one thing that um, Half Wheel has really succeeded at is that, you know, there are always some interesting things that end up on the list, some surprises, and that's because, you know, we try to go into it, and we every cigar has the equal opportunity to make it onto this list right. um, is any other one. And so... Um, who knows what next year has in store, but um, I think if we've learned anything, uh, chances are the, the number one cigar of the year will be something you probably cannot buy by the time we announce it. Unfortunately. But what I would say, Matthias, and, and everyone, when you, as you read reviews, if you do see something that gets a 91 or higher, consider that at least that's probably going to be, well, it's going to be in the pool for, uh, Most likely. For, for the list for the next year or so. Absent some crazy ratings inflation. Absolutely. And on that note, um, I'd like to thank Patrick, who came down all the way from Phoenix to enjoy our food and hospitality here and uh, announce the packaging awards and also the top 25 as well as brooks whittington um if you want to read more about the top 25 it will be on the site very shortly but uh as i mentioned i have to get back to work so it will be on the site uh probably within the next 10 minutes and um you can look at all the stats and the write-ups and those sorts of things um just as we've done in years past um i will be back on monday Uh, i will not be joined by either of my compatriots uh, but i will be back on monday to announce the consensus um live here on facebook and youtube uh, that is a award that Half Wheel host, but not really a Half Wheel award. It is a uh, project that we do every year. Where we take all of the lists that are published from magazines, blogs, YouTubers, radio shows, and kind of whoever else we can find that would be considered to be a legitimate media publication in cigars. And we take all the top 10, top 25. There's some top 15 lists and 
developing palettes has four top 25 lists and we try to put them together in a spreadsheet and make some sense of it and try to see uh what cigars are the most popular um on uh the, the various top lists end of the year lists that you see from the various cigar publications and so that will be announced on monday it's always an interesting article i don't know really much about it um we're still putting together the data um so i can't give you any hints other than steve Saka's sync will probably be on it um and if not bricks will lose some money but uh, that'll be announced Monday at 2 p.m. and the the consensus 2 will go Central. 2 p.m. Central. Um, and the consensus will go out um, shortly after the end of the YouTube and Facebook Live show, and hopefully it'll be shorter than this. And uh, we'll be back a year from now, roughly. Um, probably not in this exact same place, but uh, we'll be back a year from now to do the same thing. And um, hopefully, smoking cigars and give you the top 25 of 2019. But until then, you can check out Half Wheel for all your cigar news and reviews uh, of cigars, accessories, and, and everything else to do with this wonderful industry. But for now, I think we're going to get back to work. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.